Yes, so uh, we can start this <coughs> workshop, this symposium. Uh, welcome everybody to ADAM 2020, the first international symposium on artificial in intelligence for prevention and intervention in dementia care. Uh, I'm very glad that we have the opportunity to organize and perform this workshop. Uh, thanks to Stephanie Auer and her nice conference. And uh, I would like to welcome everyone. Uh, this is kind of uh, interdisciplinary uh, symposium, as you can see from the presentations and the setup. And uh, basically, of course, it is focused on uh, artificial intelligence and on assistive technologies. But uh, we have also an eye, of course, on psychology, uh, other aspects that uh, actually are important to understand to basically uh, perform appropriate uh, services uh, for the end user, which is the person with dementia. And uh, well, uh, let me just uh, give uh, an overview. Uh, before uh, the symposium will start. Uh, so we have a chairing committee and you can see already Sandra Schüssler, uh, who I very cordially welcome here also. And uh, also in the chairing com committee is Björn Schuller and Bettina Hüsebo. And uh, thanks to Stephanie Auer, we can host this, uh, uh, this symposium at the conference. And in the afternoon, we will have also a demo session, which is chaired by uh, Maria Fellner. So uh, may I ask uh, Sandra to give a short, uh, short impulse, so to say, <laughs> presentation about uh, what we are here for in, in terms of dementia care, please. So I'm very happy to be here today because the topic of AL technologies in dementia is my research focus and it is extremely important for the future innovative dementia care. And to focus specific on this target group is very important because we have an increase of people with dementia worldwide, we know that. And at the same time, we have rising needs of healthcare services by this target group. But we know we have limited resources and we have a decreasing of the number of caregivers who provide care for this group. And one consequence is the, that they have more and more care burden. That's a big problem and also a big problem for the future. And because of these facts, many technologies are developed. And this all these technologies like robots or like augmented reality, they can relieve and support the relatives, but also to support the healthcare staff and to help us to promote the independence of people with dementia, that they stay as long as possible uh, at home. And this is very important that they can stay at home because many people like to live at home as long as possible. And these technologies can help to stabilize dementia because they can help to monitor the people and they help that we can see very early the changes and then we can start with early interventions. And so I hope this symposium will give you a lot of inspiration for our future dementia care and for high quality dementia care. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sandra, to giving us a first viewpoint of the context uh, for the whole symposium. And uh, basically, let us have a <coughs> look, uh, <coughs> overview of what, what uh, is ahead of us and uh, will be very exciting. <clears throat> so we start with a very interesting keynote talk by Björn Schuller about mobile sensing, mobile health, and in the context of neurodegenerative diseases. Then we have a view on uh, dementia diagnosis using AI, uh, a view on brain changes, then uh, from the view of uh, 
BPSD, Behavior and Psychology uh, based uh, symptoms in dementia, Bettina Hüsebo, then we have a uh, lunch break. And uh, afterwards uh, is a session that is more about assistive technologies, about uh, serious games, and uh, starting with a presentation uh, uh, performing a sensory motor uh, games, then about psychosocial aspects, educational tool, uh, then multimodal uh, activation. And then in the end, and I'm very happy about that, we get also a view directly grounding us technologies and, and, and theoretically <laughs> perspective oriented people. Uh, what is really uh, the viewpoint from the person with dementia, the, the end user, so to say, and particularly a view on diversity, which uh, is very important today. And then afterwards, we have a demo session uh, with different uh, presentation for tablet PCs, uh, the educational tool, the social robot pepper, uh, augmented reality and virtual reality. And uh, I hope you enjoy this day together with us and uh, just be active also. Uh, you can uh, give some questions in the chat. Uh, you can also raise your hand, but maybe it's better for all to see the questions in the chat and then uh, after the video presentation so we have uh, uh, overall video presentation <clears throat> the speaker will be ready to respond uh, and uh, interact in this way <clears throat> so <clears throat> i'm happy that uh, we can start uh, so to say uh, the day with the first presentation and uh, <clears throat> this is given by uh, Björn Schuller and uh, let me briefly introduce uh, Björn. Uh, I'm extremely glad uh, that you uh, join us. Uh, Björn Schuller received a doctoral degree habilitation and adjunct teaching professor machine intelligence and signal processing from Technical University in Munich, Germany. He is a full professor of uh, artificial intelligence uh, at Imperial College in London, at the same time, a full pros professor and chair of embedded intelligence for healthcare and well being at the University of Augsburg, Germany. He is a co-founding CEO and current CSO of Odeering, an audio intelligence company in uh, Munich and Berlin, Germany. Uh, he's a visiting professor in China. He has authored uh, many, many publications, very high age index. Uh, he's a field chief editor of Frontiers in Digital Health. And uh, yeah, he served as coordinator in, in many, many European projects and was uh, and is a consultant of companies such as Barclays, UI, Samsung, and so on. So uh, you're just happy that you managed to uh, also give uh, a talk here uh, to our symposium. And uh, well, um, let's now uh, open the floor, so to say and uh, let uh, the video go on. Welcome to my talk on mHealth for neurodegenerative diseases, something to remember. <laughs> my name is Björn Schuller and thank you very, very much for this kind invitation to give this talk today here. Um, I am with the Imperial College in London and with the University of Augsburg in Germany, as well as with Ordeering. Now in this talk, I will first give you a quick overview on the idea of ambient health intelligence. And the history of medicine has moved slowly from modern medicine in the 19th century, such as modern anesthesia to medicine 2.0, <laughs> the technization that increasingly started like the x-rays or hospitals following more and more industrial principles. Move to medicine sort of 3.0 um, with increasing automation and IT, such as the first robot um, used during surgery, um, and digital patient data, for example, in Austria as early as in 2014. Now, medicine 4.0 has finally arrived at interlinked information, more semi-autonomous systems and health apps on phones or mHealth. And I today in particular want to talk about mHealth plus um, the idea of uh, injecting artificial intelligence, and in particular also to inject the Internet of Things, IOT, um, and put this all together to some sort of AIOT, <laughs> artificial intelligence plus the Internet of Things, to give you some sort of ambient health intelligence for monitoring of neurodegenerative disorders. 
So the idea is to have embedded um, systems, um, sensor signal processing, the IoT, put together with the intelligence, like artificial intelligence and particular deep learning as a field of that, but also potentially big data to learn from um, a lot of data. To put that together for healthcare and well-being, um, the elderly in this case. So we're at the intersection of computer science and electrical engineering with health science, and we're having here as said AI, IoT, and sensing. But we also have some um, other disciplines around there on the computer science side. We have here usability engineering, for example, and of course um, signal processing and all this handling of data. Um, on the other hand side, on the health science side, we have core medicine, We're talking about neurodegenerative disorders, but we also have some other intersections here with psychology, for example, to monitor well-being um, of the elderly. We have sports sciences, for example, if you want to monitor or advise on exercising and, and like as a daily routine, for example. Now, the idea, hence, is to use a rich selection of signals in the wild and in the everyday setting. So we have, for example, the ENG, um, EEG, but um, um, apart from those more, say, traditional signals, we have speech and audio and video. Um, <clears throat> and that is very rich, as we will be see, um, uh, to monitor neurodegenerative disorders in the wild <laughs> and at home. So finally, the idea is to go from neurobiology, sleep arousal systems, motor circuits, emotion circuits via behavior, um, such as skin conductance response, motor activity, autonomic functions and the like, um, which are visible or can be captured by sensors, such as um, microphone, um, biosensors, for example, wrist worn here, and our watches these days, heart rate or alike, accelerometer, but also camera um, and uh, then interaction, um, for example, from your smartphone, your social activity or like a GPS, um, light UV sensor, are you exposed to, to light, are you going outside and all of that, near field communication, are you among other people or not, um, and the IoT, we will be seeing an example later on, to put that all together to monitor the behavior in everyday um, settings and for example, realize changes um, because of neurodegenerative disorders onset. Um, and finally, um, from all this kind of data and for a condition. This could be um, sleep patterns that are changing, apnoea, for example, but it could also be Parkinson's, it could be Alzheimer's, dementia, and the like. So the idea really is to get from um, wearable devices, which are say basic, such as your um, watch, <laughs> your smartwatch or your smartphone, a lot of data and put that together with AI to get a rich assessment um, of your change in behavior. Now I mentioned this already, but the idea is not only to use your smartphone potentially and uh, your smartwatch, but even to put into place um, your ambience um, in an increasingly smart home environment and caretaking facilities could be equipped with such um, smart equipment. We can also use other things like um, the light, for example, at which time of the day are you turning on off your light could be already quite informative. We will be seeing in an example later on the usage of your fridge, the usage of your TV. So the idea being is that we really look at all your ambient devices and, and have them communicate with your um, AI that is monitoring your behavior to find onset signs of neurodegeneration. So um, we have different scenarios here, like um, fall detection activities monitoring for healthcare. We have different data modalities, uh, could be even cameras inside your living environment. It could be microphones, but it could also be other sensors. And then we put the I IoT together with AI or machine learning as a sub-discipline of AI to combine that. Now, why would we do that? <laughs> Let's first think positively about it and look into chances arising from this. So um, this is an example of roughly estimated world prevalences. Um, take these with a grain of salt, they're really estimates. Um, and it shows you um, things that we're working on in such an AIoT 
um, for health setting, um, mainly going from smart devices. We're looking into head and neck cancer, for example, MS, Rett syndrome, Parkinson's, cardiovascular disease, epilepsy, autism, depression, Alzheimer, bipolar disorders, eating disorders, sleep apnea, alcohol use disorders, osteoarthritis. In fact, these days also into COVID-19. Um, so what you can see is that this whole idea of ambient health intelligence has the potential to help uh, maybe every seven citizens on earth, if not more. Um, and we're seeing some candidates here for neurodegenerative disorders, uh, for example, here Parkinson's and Alzheimer. I will largely focus on the audio channel in the oncoming um, as an example, but I said this can always be supported by other modalities. And why would you hear the onset of Parkinson's, for example, because the motor functionality would be degrading and that means that speech production will be affected. Um, in Alzheimer, you have the cognitive side also or largely affected, um, meaning that you also from a um, uh, point of view will be able to sense that. Now, a big uh, advantage is then also that we can do the measurement anywhere in real time and hopefully earlier on. So um, meaning that on your smartwatch, um, we can be with you. We can listen in and a general practitioner, a medical doctor um, on average around the world has seven minutes of time for you if you go to a visit. Um, but your watch is with you all the time, so it gets much more data. Whether it decides by itself um, your diagnosis or gives you a screening probability, or it just collects data to be then um, summarized coming down from days to, to those seven minutes maybe to be seen by your GP, um, is something that we will be see what is best. But the whole thing is um, that you have it with you all the time. Real time means that once things happen, um, it more or less has the information immediately available. Um, we know this, for example, from cardiac attack uh, warnings from your wrist um, by the Apple Watch. But the same idea is here, of course, that it gives you immediate feedback. And earlier really means that we can, because we are with you uh, at any moment in time, recognize uh, onsets much, much earlier of neurodegeneration. Now, um, that sounds all very promising and great, doesn't it? Um, but of course, this comes um, with a couple of challenges from the technical side, of course, also from the ethical side. Um, and I would like to now go into solutions um, that we have at hand. Um, this is somehow a bit more techy, um, but the major point is to show that we are sort of well equipped. Sometimes, of course, we still need to do a little more. Now, a major challenge comes with the hardware. Um, so the hardware um, is often noisy uh, in the sensor signals. So speech, as an example, is of course noisy in everyday environment because there's um, ambience around you. Um, it might be your dog, your cat, it might be your phone ringing, whatever. Um, there is always noise around. So we need to somehow cope with that. Another big problem is missing data. Um, we have just been doing a large study in the UK um, for depression and, and other um, things where we had 1,000 patients or more enrolled. And we had a feedback ratio of 7% um, showing you that um, despite those participants in the study having been paid and, and being affected by um, some health state um, or particular attention need, the feedback ratio is very low, 7% uh, of data. And uh, if you add to that sense of failure or simply data drop out, it becomes clear that we have to cope with that. Then we often have unknown signals and pre-processing involved, unknown pre-processing, simply because um, if we use a professional um, smartphone, um, smart gear device, um, the manufacturers of those usually do not give you all the details of what is being done and the specification of the microphone pre-processing and the likes, cameras, whatever we use. So the raw data is usually not accessible to us and we have to deal with a somehow unknown uh, signal um, and still be able to infer the health state from that. Now, um, as those manufacturers largely make their revenue with the um, 
selling of hardware, not so much of software algorithms, we have to be um, ready to um, cope with short life span on the market, meaning that we do not know what exactly is inside and the device will not be there for a long time. So once a new generation comes out, we have to readapt to that. So we have to be very fast in um, providing solutions that work with a certain hardware, knowing that um, soon thereafter, there will be new um, versions of this hardware. So at best, we will be able to transfer knowledge from the old hardware to the new hardware and need to be smart about finding tech solutions that can cope with transferring knowledge um, uh, to, to be able to exploit more data, even though the lifespan on the market is rather short. Now, I wanted to show you some of our technical solutions and in particular where we are. Um, first is the noise. So I told you that, for example, in the audio signal, uh, we always have noise present. The same, of course, holds for any other kind of signal. If you want to measure the heart rate um, from the wrist, um, of course, there is also some sort of noise because of bad attachment to the wrist or um, hair um, uh, in between the sensor and the skin and the likes. Um, we also show here um, our solutions, which are free for usage, um, uh, like Enhance, usually on GitHub, if you would be interested in those. And of course, you can contact um, us at any moment in time to get help on those. Enhance is, as most of what I will be showing, a deep learning solution here to enhance the speech signal. And I have brought with me some examples which are particularly challenging. 0 dB SNR, uh, meaning that the noise and the interference are same intensity. And male-male overtalk, so same gender being usually a nightmare in, in terms of separation. So here we have our first example. You will be hearing the disturbed signal first and then after deep learning clean up. That was male-male overtalk at 0 dB. And now you can hear what we can separate from that. And there was a game where he dropped. And you can hear that the other voices are clearly not intelligible any longer. It's almost not present any longer. And these days, as you can hear from that, we're really in a position to do even such severe disturbances. Second example is a male-female mix. That the a narcissist. Into now into the audience's hands. That would be brilliant. Uh, we've, uh, Over we've the line. Really hard. And we believe in it and separation. Actually, all that you can do now is in the audience's hand. Uh, we've, uh, we've worked really hard and we believe in it. Now we can do this similarly with any kind of other signals and you can easily imagine that this already is quite useful for many elderly users um, in terms of hearing improvement. Um, what you can do here is you have your, in the middle block here, your speech or whatever signal enhancement, and you can embed something on both sides. You can give the network information um, on the target and on the interference context, meaning that if I train this to separate a voice that is known, I give it some examples of the known voice. And later on, it's better in a position to separate that known voice from, from the interference. If I even know something about the interference, let's say my vacuum cleaner and so on and so forth, and I know the interferences that usually occur, I can do an even better job. And then, um, as you can see, this deep um, learning here leads to much, much better signal distortion ratios, for example, here than traditional approaches. What about missing data? So here we're looking at speech data missing. Um, here, this curve here is the speech signal. And the red line here is zero concealment, meaning that if this part here of the signal is missing, I have just the missing information and the speech signal drops out. The orange line here is a linear interpolation. And of course, it's completely insufficient to just assume a linear interpolation. All these sample points in between are missing. But um, the blue line here is what a deep neural network can restore um, from the green line, which is the missing speech signal. And that is quite um, close to it in many way uh, in many of those time regions. This is, for example, recognizing um, arousal and valence from the voice. If you don't know what that is, that is about emotion from the voice, and it's not so important. What is important is that with that um, recovery from a deep neural network of the speech signal, we can become very good um, at um, yeah filling in something that is useful for the target task at hand. 
For example, here with our network, we can recover um, even at 50% lost information, the recognition of emotion as if it was almost as um, undisturbed as the original signal. So we can do a lot in repairing um, missing signals with such a deep neural network approach. So a recurrent neural network if you're interested in the details. Now, what about the unknown um, signal and pre-processing? Machine learning these days holds uh, uh, for you at hand a tool called end-to-end -end learning that is very powerful. It works, for example, for audio, for video. And what it does is that you just give audio plus a label or video plus a label to a deep neural network, um, if you're interested, with convolutional neural network layers and recurrent layers to self-learn to represent what is characteristic for your phenomenon of interest and then recognize it. In our case, it would be, um, for example, recognizing signs of Parkinson's disease, signs of dementia um, from the audio or even text or whatever uh, video. Plus the label is enough for the deep neural network to learn how to represent the phenomenon in the audio video text and, and then recognize it. Here, um, we're just looking at such a network. You can see that the infrastructure or the, the, sorry, the architecture of these networks is quite different here, for example, for audio or for vision. So a last bit of, let's say, expert knowledge is still in shaping these networks, but you can use templates and our NTU toolkit, for example, holds those at hand for you. And then just give the data and the label to the network and it learns to do the job by itself. Shockingly, this works even better um, in most of the recent studies than traditional features crafted by experts. Now, another big problem, of course, is little data. Um, for many um, health problems, we do not have a lot of data available. COVID-19, of course, is an extreme case these days because we clearly do not have um, a lot of data available, at least at the beginning in, in March or so, let's say this year, we were very much under pressure to uh, generalize from very little example. Um, one way of solving this is transfer learning. And in our deep spectrum toolkit, for example, which you can find on GitHub, we have been showing that you can use image pre-trained networks to recognize emotion, snoring sounds and other things in audio. How does this work? Um, the image networks are pre-trained again with such convolutional neural networks on millions of images. We're representing audio as an image um, here by a spectrogram. You may know this from your stereo um, hi-fi equipment um, where you have these graphical equalizers. Uh, you put the audio time signal into a time frequency representation as a sort of image. And then this image is fed into the um, image pre-trained deep neural network trained on millions of images. And this is used as a representation. Um, so we're only uh, using the image network up to the final stage where it usually would say cloud, sun, bus, whatever. We do not use that, but the pre-final stage of the neural network and then feed that into a network that uses this kind of representation to make a decision trained for Parkinson's, Alzheimer's dementia. This way we could um, be even better than untrained networks from, from little data and, and really uh, have a first good improvement. The second part is so-called generative adversarial networks where we can generate new observations which are similar but not the same. So sort of we're imagining new training examples. Maybe you can imagine this like um, if you hear somebody's voice, you can also imagine that voice talking in an angry or in a friendly way. So you're generating your new training material sort of for that same person um, in, in other emotions, in other languages, whatever. And with deep neural networks, we can do the same thing today. If you have a few examples of dementia or Alzheimer's for COVID-19, we can have a network imagine how a target person or other people would say the same things with or without COVID-19 and hence sort of improve our training material. Here we have been showing that this works like a charm for emotion recognition. Um, the end-to-end -end learning has been clearly improved by adding self-generated training data augmentation. This network produces with a generator new observations and tries to recognize if the new observations are correct itself. So it plays a game with itself, generate material and try to fool um, the recognition side if the material is um, original data or fake data. Anyhow, it's a sort of internal game the network plays and in this game it can produce new data. 
Um, we can produce with that also new speech or video, um, so new images, new audio. And here I show you one example where we have a neural network um, generate new speech. This is not like the speech synthesis you may know from your phone or from the public transport, because there you have usually pre-recorded speech, meaning that some real person spoke language and that is put together in new ways. Here a neural network really speaks with a new voice that is not existent in the real world by itself. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So these were on purpose different voices. And now we can target these to sound, let's say, like somebody with Parkinson's, with different age, with different gender, and so on and so forth, and generate hence from a few examples, new examples. Um, a very important aspect is also holism. So um, here we're putting together many different so-called modalities like visual feed, audio feed, physiology, for example, your heart rate or like in a large, large neural network. Um, but then um, we also integrate contextual knowledge like a patient record. And we do not only um, target uh, one sort of phenomenon like your emotion or let's say your dementia or whatever, but we try to see the whole picture. We want to at the same time see your gender, um, your individual information, your cultural background and so on and so forth. Why? Because if you want to recognize, let's say, um, Alzheimer's um, from, from the language, um, we need to understand who you are, what is your background and so on and so forth before we try to assess from, from, your, from your wording and the like if you're suffering from dementia. So um, similarly, if you want to recognize Parkinson's from motor uh, re or ability reduction because of Parkinson's onset, we need to understand um, your age. Um, we need to understand if you're in a particular health condition like a cold or something or not to then um, understand if this is actually Parkinson's or not. Now, all of that uh, sounds like a whole lot of um, voodoo, <laughs> maybe in any case, like a black box. So we have deep neural networks and we don't know the bricks uh, of Lego, whatever, <laughs> literally speaking, uh, that are put together there. We don't know what they do. Can we explain what is gone going? And um, why are we telling you that you have a Parkinson's or Alzheimer's um, onset or, or a diagnosis by the neural network? So things we can do are um, somewhat limited, but we can do some things. One thing that we're doing is we correlate the activations of neurons in a deep neural network with features that we know that we would have used in the past. Here, for example, we correlated neural network activations uh, for emotion recognition um, with features that we know, and we found that it is mainly correlating with energy and uh, pitch fundamental frequency. In other words, the neural network uses something relating to prosody. And this is exactly what we would do. We would listen to your prosody to recognize your emotion. So we can now explain that the neural network self-learned, if you remember, just give audio and labels emotion, for example, and it learns to represent this and make a decision. But we can now say that it learned to use prosody um, to do this kind of decision. The other thing that we can, for example, look at is the timing it uses. Here we can uh, look into why would it uh, decide on your emotion be this or that at this moment in time because of past emotion onset. Similarly, Parkinson's, we can say, I think that you're having a, a Parkinson's diagnosis because of your onset over the last days, weeks, whatever. If you're thinking about words, um, for example, when we talk about Alzheimer's um, analysis, uh, we can also see um, was a deep neural network here on the left-hand side as a black box sort of processing linguistics. Um, the attention profiles, we call this, which words did the network lay emphasis upon? Here again, we're talking about um, sentiment. There's some sort of emotional um, phenomenon and it used beeindruckendsten or langweilig to make a decision how much you had um, liked or disliked something that makes sense. And you can say, okay, it looked at these or that words to make its decision. Now, if you think of, let's say Parkinson's again, or Alzheimer's, it can, uh, Alzheimer's in particular, sorry, when you look into linguistics, you can do the same thing and you can say, it looked in particular onto these or those words to make its decision. 
Now, uh, a few more technical details include efficiency, um, and we do not want to reveal your personal information too much, and we want to be very compact in what we transmit. If you have a client server distributed processing, we're using so-called uh, vector quantization to reduce the information here. So um, rather than sending the full data stream of yours, we assign for each vector in time a number of the nearest similar observation we have been making in the past um, you can imagine rather than sending here these vectors just sending a string here makes it much more reduced we can also just count the number of observations here reducing it further but what we can see is that for these different phenomena um, we're looking into in health emotion um, alcohol intoxication head and neck cancer whatever it is we can reduce by an order of 10 the data that we're submitting to a server, for example, uh, and still have very similar results. So what I'm saying is we're reducing the data down to a tenth of the information, um, which increases your privacy because we're not submitting your original data, but only a tenth compressed, and we still have the same kind of accuracy at the end of the day. If you want to run your um, analysis on your smartwatch, for example, we also have to be very efficient in the size of the model. And here um, we can see that we can use techniques such as not using full precision for the weights in the neural network, but rather just integer values for the weights in the network. We can also cut some neurons out of the network to reduce the size of the network. What happens at the end of the day is that we have a model here for recognizing code from your speech reduced from 229 megabyte to 12 megabyte, still having the same performance. Um, in other words, we have a reduction um, by 95%. Um, we only use 5% of the original network size and have the same accuracy. Meaning that we can really compress or squeeze, as we say, <laughs> your network um, into very small uh, storage requirement and get the same effect. Privacy overall is a big concern. Here we have been showing over 12 years with our community what you can recognize from the voice. And let me just very quickly say it's a lot. So if you want to recognize, for example, your um, Parkinson's uh, onset here um, from the voice, be reminded that we also recognize your age, gender, your personality profile, if you're having a cold and whatnots. Just recently, for example, we have been recognizing if you're wearing a facial mask or not in the context of COVID-19. Um, so we can hear even your heart rate, we can hear your height down to five or seven centimeters. So it's a lot of confidential information in your voice um, and similarly in the face and your walking behavior and the likes. So we have to be careful um, what can all be assessed from, from that as well. So we want to protect your privacy. And if you've seen Ready Player One in this movie, they're having a scene where they're using emotion hiding software. They have a conversation like mine here. <laughs> and maybe you're not seeing my real face. Maybe in reality, I would be much more nervous giving a keynote talk, but you're seeing a real-time smoothened version where I appear all calm. Okay, it's not like that, but <laughs> we're working on that. So um, two things you can do is, first of all, fool AI. If you want to fool AI, you can use what we call adversarial attacks. And we're adding a little bit of noise, unperceptible or perceivable, sorry, to humans, but enough to, to trick an AI. For example, you have an angry voice and you add noise, not percept perceivable by humans, but the AI then sings its uh, happy voice. Similar, of course, you could imagine um, covering your Parkinson's or your dementia, whatever, to an AI by adding this little noise. That means that a human would still have the same sensation, um, angry voice or ha uh, not happy voice, but the AI would be fooled. You can also convert the voice. It's more difficult with the language in real time, of course, or close to impossible, but we can convert and mask the voice or if you use video, the facial appearance or things like that to hide these phenomena. So in the voice, it would mean that we hide trembling in the voice, for example, to cover your Parkinson's. No, <clears throat> sorry, if you want everybody to profit from this new technology, we would want everybody's data to be used in the training, but we don't want to give all your original data um, because of what I just said. So there's all the information in there. It's your identity, it's your um, height, your uh, native language, everything is in there. So rather than sharing everybody's audio or video, we could also do what we call federated learning. And in federated learning, we do not feedback from everybody the original data to the server, but we feedback only how their local neural network adapted to them. So 
these are not original audio video things. They are not even features from that. They're just how did their neural network uh, locally change fed back to everybody else. And we can also average about a, um, um, can average a couple of users and feed that back. So this is really not coming from you any longer, but everybody can profit from this. We have been showing that we can use federated learning to reach the same or even sometimes better results for everybody in updating models than as if he had sent original material. Okay, sorry, in the interest of time, I have to skip this but I wanted to show you some application examples. And I have picked two for you. The first one is Alzheimer dementia recognition. And at Interspeech, the largest speech conference, we have just been participating in the Alzheimer's dementia recognition through spontaneous speech or address for short challenge. So in this challenge, the participants had to recognize um, from spontaneous speech, Alzheimer's dementia. Um, and why does that work? Because, um, uh, declines in speech and language um, production and, and generation are a key early marker of Alzheimer's dementia. Um, the organizers of this challenge had provided 54 participants with Alzheimer's dementia and 54 without, in the age range of 50 to 80 years, roughly balanced. They had formulated two tasks for the participants. The first one is a two class Alzheimer's dementia or not Alzheimer's dementia decision to be made. The second one was going through a spectrum, a spectrum um, from the mini mental state examination score or MMSD score. So in other words, how severe is your Alzheimer's dementia um, on, on the spectrum? Now we have been trying a lot of different things, including um, acoustic features and linguistic features down here using traditional features using end-to-end -end learning so where you just give audio and labels to the uh, network what we can see here first is that end-to-end -end learning so just giving audio and labels of the score or dementia or not to the network worked better than traditional features quite sufficiently uh, significantly sorry better so we can see here, here an accuracy of uh, 47.1 percent over traditional features, it's 63.9%. So the whole, all this learning with a machine learning approach just from observation plus label worked like a charm really. Um, the linguistic features, however, worked better. That is um, understandable because we're talking about Alzheimer's dementia at 84.2%. And if we fused it, we could um, gain a little bit. So acoustics plus linguistics were at 85%. That's the two class dementia or not problem 50% would be chance level so you can imagine how well this actually works already 85% if 50% is chance level now looking into the um, continuous task um, so recognizing the severity on the spectrum of the MMSE score we had a root mean square error of 4.65 that means that on this scale of 30 points we're off um, on average by uh, 4.65. So the scale is zero to 30 and we're off by um, yeah, roughly five points, meaning that this works quite well already. Um, what you're seeing in these plots here is the accuracy um, over the MMSE score and the mean root mean square error over the MMSE score showing that, um, let's look only into the error maybe, um, that over the different scores here, we have not an equal distribution in the challenge data uh, the pink ones are the Alzheimer's um, candidates and the blue ones are the control group with very high MMSE scores, so not AD candidates. And you can see depending on the severity, the error is lower or higher, but overall this all makes sense. And we have a good um, automatic assessment from the speech and language on Alzheimer's dementia. The second example includes the Internet of Things. We're looking at the TV and the fridge usage behavior with colleagues from the University of Tokyo to um, have an early warning of um, health state um, deterioration of elderly users. We're having um, the uh, behavior of fridge and TV observed over one month um, with 100 participants originally, 70 Six were used in the final study and they were uh, giving answers to their appetite, pain and sleep quality. 
and we have a condition that is noteworthy if he had a deterioration in any of the three, appetite, pain, and sleep quality, or combinations thereof. In other words, just from TV usage and um, fridge usage, we want to recognize if something is wrong with their appetite, pain, or sleep quality. We have been using deep neural networks again, and the best um, unweighted accuracy is roughly 60%, uh, 50% is chance level. So you can see this is not great, <laughs> but it works and it's significant. And it's just through appliances. It's just the fridge and the TV, and yet it already gives you above chance level. So in summary, we have been seeing um, mobile health from your uh, smartphone, from your wrist, and potentially in combination with ambience like your fridge or TV to assess, for example, Alzheimer's dementia early on. Now, the outlook is that we want to have a richer multisensory and multimodal exploitation of what is around you <laughs> and what is on your devices already. I have been showing you the many things that you have in your smartphone, cameras, your um, near field communication sensor, your UV data, GPS and whatnot. So we haven't been even looking into this yet, in these examples. We want to have better holism, so seeing the overall picture and not just focusing on Alzheimer dementia. Um, longitudinal adaptation, so because we have elderly users uses over months, just adapt to them over all this time of usage. And better integration of context. So maybe if you know something that a tragic case has been happening in their um, yeah, day, um, we can integrate such context and know that there has been a trigger, an external trigger for changes in behavior. We want to better exploit what we have already learned, features, models, and whatnots to be able to transfer this for new devices, for new users, and so on and so forth. We want to better exploit bigger data once more and more uh, such approaches are being used. And we want to have less human involvement in crafting sy such systems, so more automatic machine learning, as we call it, um, to have the systems um, be even faster in adapting to new health states, new users, and the likes. So we're on a very good way um, to AIoT, um, artificial intelligence mixed with the Internet of Things, for health assessment, and in particular today, of course, for neurodegenerative disorders. So let me just quickly thank very much my teams in London and Augsburg. Um, I'm not um, having enough slide space here to put everybody at my company or gearing here into this picture. But thanks to all of you. We have been seeing a lot of results from these nice um, um, researchers here. <laughs> Let me thank all the current projects that are ongoing that have part um, participated in funding the research we have been doing. And let me invite you to submit your contributions, if you have any, to Frontiers in Digital Health, um, which I'm the field chief editor of. And we're having the first year very successfully behind us. So the journey is growing and gaining momentum. Um, a lot of research topics ongoing. And by that, let me say thank you very much again for your time and interest today. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Bjorn, for your really uh, amazing insight into the real challenges and uh, exciting results uh, from your work and also by others. Um, actually, uh, yeah, it would be nice now to answer maybe some questions. There's one uh, from, uh, from uh, I, can, I can't read it. Good morning, congratulations on the event. Would it be possible to access the presentation? Okay, also after the event, it would be possible. But uh, maybe Bjorn, uh, one question. Uh, how do you see the, the near and a little bit farther future uh, to actually migrate uh, this kind of amazing dementia recognition by, by acoustics, by speech, whatever, into everyday services. Uh, you have shown, for example, this kind of fridge and TV. Can you imagine uh, something like this? Yeah, so we're, uh, of course, very interested to make this all a reality. And that is why I showed so many different aspects of green so putting it into embedded usage uh, of package loss concealment noise cancellation and so on and so forth my feeling is that technically speaking we have all the bits and pieces but we really need to put them together and of course that takes a lot thank of you for the invitation to present at your symposium my name is Dr. Goldman. Sorry. What? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's early sorry <laughs> 
So what is um, mostly needed at this point is really to, to put all these parts together, also the federated learning, for example. So we know how to, to cope with all these aspects of real world application at this point, but it takes um, some industrial player to put them together in, in my feeling. And that of course can still take some time for um, development, but also for testing and, and medical um, permission to, to use it in such a context in the lives. Thank you so much. Uh, how do you see maybe a second question from my side? Uh, you, you get congratulations <clears throat> actually on the web. A very nice presentation also from Henrik Hauterblund. Very, uh, thanks for a nice presentation. In terms of practicalities, how easy would it be to use the methods for screening the population at a larger scale, for example, for Alzheimer's dementia? So this large scale, maybe you can have a brief response to that. Yeah, so um, generally speaking, as this could be rolled out and, uh, as an app, for example, to be downloaded for your smartphone or like, um, I don't think that it is a problem to do a large scale scan. What we think is very promising, however, is to have a longitudinal adaptation and uh, continued usage over, let's say, a consecutive number of days, such that the system can adapt a little bit to you. And if you use it regularly, of course, it could also register changes in your behavior and for that reason uh, come to a better assessment. So large scale shouldn't be an uh, issue really once it works, um, but we need to, to also work more on longitudinal adaptation. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, maybe another question, how, you, how do you see the opportunities to <clears throat> have a early detection, you know, like uh, not only during <clears throat> Alzheimer, but uh, for the prevention, um, do you do you have some attempts maybe to go into this direction in the future? Um, you have worked on several neurodegenerative uh, disease uh, projects and so on. So how is your intuition about that? <laughs> yeah, so speaking about earlier, we have in particular neurodevelopmental, so on the opposite end of the age scale uh, disorders, shown that we can do that, but what we needed to do that was material recorded before the diagnosis has been made. In other words, we needed old Christmas and birthday videos from parents um, um, of their children uh, made before the children have been diagnosed, say with rat syndrome, fragile X, autism or whatnot. So if we had something similar here, we would have dementia uh, diagnosis um, and we have access to older material from the same persons um, this would, of course, be very interesting and, and promising to do. Colleagues in Erlangen, for example, have, for example, looked into authors and they looked into their earlier works before the authors have been uh, diagnosed with uh, Alzheimer's, for example, or dementia, and could show that this works. And I think, why not? <laughs> um, early signs are often overlooked um, until they become more significant, and I'm quite <coughs> positive that we could pick them up. Thank you so much uh, again. <clears throat> I would give you a hand for your talk. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Uh, it was great to have you here. And uh, now we will uh, go to the next talk, uh, which is given by uh, Esther Braun. Uh, I will just uh, switch um, to uh, this kind of next presentation. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, uh, let me briefly introduce Dr. Esther Braun is assistant professor at the Erasmus Medical Center in Rotterdam, the Netherlands, Department of Radiology and Nuclear Medicine. She's PI of the research line Neuroimage Analysis and Machine Learning. And with her group, she researches novel brain imaging biomarkers and machine learning approaches for improving diagnosis and prediction of brain diseases based on imaging. <clears throat> on this topic, Dr. Braun co-organized two international grant challenges for the objective comparison of algorithms. She was awarded among uh, certainly other awards, the Young E-Scientist Award 2018 and the Alzheimer Netherlands Young Outstanding Researcher Award in 2020. And uh, we're just very uh, excited to hear more about your uh, uh, talk and uh, I will just start uh, 
the video about AI for dementia diagnosis, imaging, generalizability, and open science. Enjoy it. So the diagnostic process for dementia can take a substantial process of periods of time. So for late onset dementia, it can take 2.8 years on average, and for younger patients that get dementia, it can take even longer, more than four years. Uh, so this is a long time, bringing a lot of uncertainty for patients, but the, in, the window of opportunity for advancing this diagnosis is even larger than these few years, because research has shown um, results from the, from the Diane study, so the, uh, heritable Alzheimer's disease have shown that even 20 years before uh, onset of dementia, changes are already visible in the brain. So both on uh, PET scans and on structural MRI scans, changes can be seen. So this implicates that we can advance the diagnostic process. And why is this important uh, to make an early diagnosis of dementia? So first, an early diagnosis would give patients access to supportive uh, therapies, so give them um, help them maintaining their independence for longer and would also result in less healthcare costs. And in addition, uh, late treatment is also a major factor in the failure of clinical trials. So many clinical trials, trials for new medication for Alzheimer's disease, they fail. And that's because patients are expected to be in too advanced stage of the disease already. So for that reason, we also want to be able to do early diagnosis. So currently the diagnosis is being made uh, by a multidisciplinary meeting usually based on different aspects of the disease. So performance in daily living, cognitive test fluid, biomarkers, MRI scans. And um, yeah, these are mostly in interpreted qualitatively. And for MRI scans, this has been improved over the past years, uh, going from qualitative inter interpretation to quantitative interpretation. So whereas it used to be and still is in some places, of course. Uh, some atrophy is visible, so it's subjective qualitative score by a radiologist. Uh, new software uh, by many startup companies help supporting this uh, into an automatic interpretation, which is more quantitative. So for example, brain volume is 70% of what is average for this age. And so one of those, some, one of those spin off companies give software like this. This is a spin-off company from my lab in Erasmus MC, and this is now used in um, clinical practice in our institution and uh, under the hospitals around the world. Uh, so this supports, uh, this is supporting from qualitative interpretation of MRI to quantitative interpretation, but I think we can more, do more to advance uh, the dementia diagnosis, and artificial intelligence may be of help here. So um, we can learn from large-scale databases, not only the quantitative for MRI, but also for all kinds of different biomarkers and integrate them. And from the MRI also use more detailed information. So this is what is the promise for me of artificial intelligence. And I would like to present you two of my projects that I'm working on, a cross-cohort validation study and an open science initiative. So first, um, Machine learning has been shown to be quite successful for a dementia diagnosis, so high performances are being reported. So a curious area under the curve, around 90% for distinguishing Alzheimer's disease patients from healthy controls, and uh, around 75% for predicting which patients with malcognitive impairment are going to convert to Alzheimer's disease within, for example, the next three years. So this is in research showing quite good uh, performances and the most commonly used methods are uh, support factor machine classifier and um, structural MRI is the most used input feature. So in recent years, uh, neural networks, so especially convolutional neural networks have shown very successful in many medical imaging applications. But for Alzheimer's disease diagnosis, they have not yet shown to outperform conventional classifiers. And in this comparison study, so I want to, com I am comparing the support factor machine, the linear support factor machine with a neural network we, where we use um, all convolutional neural network. I won't go into the details, but this shows um, our all convolutional neural network, seven 
uh, layers oh, and then alternatively uh, stride one, stride two. Um, yeah, according to current state of the art uh, is the network that we used. And uh, we also compared two types of pre-processing. So for conventional classifiers like the support vector machine, it was also always accepted that we needed to do some pre-processing. So we need to compute some volume of the brain before giving that information to the classifier. Um, for neural networks, they promise that they do everything end to end so that they can also just get these features. So like these volume atrophy measures from the scans, but no study has really compared this. So that's what we're doing as well. So we are giving two types of images to the classifier, two types of separate inputs. So first we do minimal processing. So just take um, the structural MRI images, morph them rigidly to a template and don't do any other processing. And the second dedicated pre-processing is what is often done successfully in support vector machine classifiers, computing gray matter modulated maps. So computing and the density of gray matter that is uh, available in each voxel. And um, so what I started out saying about uh, talking about this study is the cross cohort generalizability. So uh, it is, uh, although these methods show high performances, it's largely unknown how they would perform in clinical practice. And um, before we can even try that, it's crucial to know how performance we generalize from one study population to another study population. And there's only a few, so I listed them below. I found only three studies assessing performance in a completely separate cohort. And their results, they varied quite a bit. So one, some of those studies only found a minor reduction and others found a severe drop. So better understanding of how performance generalizes across cohorts is crucial before applying such methods in routine clinical practice. So that's also what I am assessing, um, training my methods on a very frequently used data set for this, the Alzheimer's Disease Neuroimaging Initiative, multi-centric trial, and used a lot as a set for machine learning studies. And I am applying this to the external data set of Parelsnoor, which in Dutch means string of pearls, and it's a um, biobank on uh, neurodegenerative diseases, including data from eight university hospitals, tertiary memory clinics. And it's the first time that these data are used for such a study. So to summarize everything I just said, um, I will validate uh, machine learning approaches. First do cross-validation on the ACNI data set, so Alzheimer's disease patients versus controls. And then I will do external validation. So first within OPNI on um, predicting which patients with Alzheimer's disease will convert to uh, Alzheimer's disease within three years. And secondly, on an external data set. So the PND, Parosnur data set, and then applying it to both Alzheimer's versus subjective cognitive decline and the MCI converters again. So now we go to the results. So where I am comparing on the x-axis, the two types of input features and in colors, you see the support factor machine and um, the neural network. So um, the first you see is that um, the modulated gray matter map, so the pre-processed images, they perform better than the minimally processed ones. This is true for both um, the network the CNN and the SVM. Um, and if we then look at the modulated gray matter maps, performance of both classifiers, so the conventional and the deep learning methods, they are actually the same. So we also looked at which voxels contributed to those classifications. So on the left again for the minimally processed ones and on the right for the, uh, for the processed ones, and especially for uh, the modulated gray matter map, we see a large involvement as expected of the hippocampus and the medial temporal lobe. This is a bit more spread out for the unprocessed images, but there we also see those uh, locations. For CNN, there's different methods uh, to visualize to get some insight in which areas get the most attention. So we use gradient backpropagation, um, guided backpropagation saliency maps, which is 
quite accepted, but we found it harder to interpret. Um, uh, so here activation was more spread, widely spread. So for the modelate gray matter map, we mainly saw involvement of the subcortical structures, uh, white matter regions that are prone to white matter hyperintensities and the cerebellum, but not so much of the medial temporal lobe. So um, then we applied this method to a prediction in MCI. And there we see that, um, oh, I see. <laughs> Yeah, I put the wrong plot here. Uh, it's accuracy instead of uh, area under the curve, but that doesn't change the story uh, whatsoever. So we see here less of an improvement of uh, gray, modulated, gray matter modulated maps. I think we did see that a bit more when I had showed the area under the curve, but I do see that um, SVM is a bit better than um, CNN here. So when we, um, oh here, it's very small, but here you, you can see the plot for the area under the curve. Um, so no significant differences, but gray matter modulated maps are a bit better than the C1 weighted images here. So now we um, extrapolate these results, apply these methods to the external validation sets, so Parosnur. And uh, let's first focus on the Alzheimer's versus controls. And there we actually see the same pattern in the external validation set as in the OPNI data set. Uh, so better performance of modulated gray matter maps and similar performance of uh, SVM and CNN, but uh, performance dropped a bit. So from 0.94, it dropped to 0.90 which is a small drop, but it's, uh, it is um, border significant. It's not really significant. Uh, so, but we did see a drop and then for the MCIs, something interesting happens as well, um, where we see that um, especially SVM performance reduces while CNN performance reduces not that much. So CNN generalizes a bit better to the external data sets. So in conclusion, we obtain similar performance for the SVM and the CNN in optic cross-validation. The modulated gray matter maps are best for both classifiers and we see a minor drop in performance when applied to the external data sets. So CNN generalized better than SVM to the MCR experiment in the external data sets. So this work on external validation we hope may contribute to translation of machine learning to clinical practice. So secondly, I want to talk about uh, another study. So this is uh, the TEDPOL Grand Challenge that I organized together with colleagues from University College London. And it's about prediction of the future of patients at risk for uh, Alzheimer's disease. So whereas the previous study focused only on structural MRI uh, this one focuses on any types of biomarkers that are available. Um, and it compares uh, methods for prediction developed by various international research groups. So they could choose any methods that they preferred that they thought would do the problem, like regression, machine learning, deep learning, clinical expertise, disease progression modeling, to predict the clinical outcome uh, or other variables in one year. And the goal of this, so it is a grand challenge. So the goal is to have an objective comparison of state-of-the-art methods. So to know where we are, where, what the state of the art is, whether we are good enough to, predict, to use such methods, for example, in clinical trials, and what then would be the best approach to do this. And uh, to this international challenge, 34 teams participated with a total of 92 methods. And the task was to predict three target domains at one year uh, after inclusion. So that is diagnosis, an MRI measure of ventricle volume, and a cognition score. And we evaluated those methods on data of 219 uh, participants in the OPNI data set. So the results, so I will go very briefly through this. 
um, the results. So I here show here the results table for diagnosis. And uh, in red, you see the winning methods. And in green, you see, so we define some very simple methods. And um, most of the teams performed better than our really simple methods. And the winning methods, a boosting method did really well with an um, multi-class area on the curve of 0.93. Um, and the same holds for a prediction of the MRI measurements. So methods could predict pretty well how diagnosis and the MRI scan would involve, but this was not true for the cognitive method. So likely there was too much noise in the cognitive test. We could not really predict it. And maybe if we take a longer follow-up time, it could be done better. So this is a brief uh, sneak into the results. Full results can be found on the website and in the paper. Uh, but what we conclude from this is that current prediction algorithms are um, quite accurate for predicting clinical diagnosis and ventricle volume. So they could be used or tested for use in clinical trials. But I felt like something was still missing here because these methods are, we have um, these 90 methods that are being developed and nothing happens with them. They stay with their researchers. So what I was aiming for is to make these algorithms available to other researchers to enable further development of them and also further validation by collaboration. So um, in collaboration with the eScience Center, we are we developed, we are developing a general framework to easily reuse those algorithms and share them. So more info can be found on our website. And the objective was to enable reuse of the algorithm. So to collect them, rewrite them into a standardized code base. And we are now evaluating this. So if we can, with collected algorithms, reproduce um, the tuple challenge results and we, whether we can assess, so we can extend the validation, whether we can assess their generalizability on an external data set. So for that, we will use the same data set as I just presented from the Pausner study. Um, so very briefly how we did that. So we set up a standardized code base using Python and Jupyter notebooks, and we aim for rewriting all algorithms into a standard form using one train and one predict functions that will do the full thing. And that makes it easier to call them since they will all be called in the same way. So the current status, we had a hackathon in July with very enthusiastic teams. Um, so this is really work in progress. Three algorithms are fully tested now and five teams, uh, five codes are being shared by their teams. And we are now working on this to run them locally and performing the validation study. So this is definitely uh, being continued. And that brings me to the end of my talk. I talked about uh, diagnostic classification using machine learning and uh, to understand mainly the generalizability um, across data sets and the comparison study of SVM and CNN. And I showed my uh, TEDPO share projects on sharing uh, state-of-the-art methods for Alzheimer's disease prediction. I thank you very much for your attention. So thank you so much for this exciting insight into the state of the art and your uh, interesting and promising results uh, and uh, also about this competition. Very, very uh, interesting. Uh, currently, there are not yet uh, questions. So this was very interesting. How do you relate your work to um, something in the direction of explainable AI? So I, I would ask myself, for example, how how, how is the weighting of, of these different brain regions to, to, your, uh, to the overall results? Is there something in this direction uh, already done? Uh, how do you see it? Yes, uh, that, thank you very much. Um, so I looked a bit into it uh, on the slides I showed. So for uh, support factor machines, we use the significance maps. And um, so permutation-based methods to show which regions are involved. And that gave us, as we expected, hippocampus mediotemporal lobe. 
but for uh, CNNs, for uh, deep networks, there's many methods available uh, and also currently being developed, uh, but it's a bit harder to interpret. So we chose here to use a, a backpropagation CDNC map. And um, yeah, that gave us some insight, but not as clear as uh, the support vector machine. Uh, well, I do think that for interpretation, uh, it is, yeah, so the performance is good. So that's, that's I think, the most important thing. But for more understanding, uh, these maps give insights, and I think better methods are still uh, needed. And I would be very interested in learning better methods and being involved in that. Yes. Yeah, very, very interesting and, and, and promising uh, work that you're doing. There's, in the meantime, there's a question. How are these significance maps computed? LRP, Deep Taylor Decomposition, very interesting research. Thank you for the talk. <laughs> Thank you. The first one was the question. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Thank you for the compliment. Yeah. Um, no, so it, it uses uh, guided backpropagation. I've also read about LRP and the Deep, uh, so there's been uh, a comparison of methods for this application. It's uh, was presented in the um, German Medical Imaging Conference last year by Martin Dirba, who, who compared different methods. And his conclusion, their conclusion was that indeed a deep Taylor composition was their preferred method, but that in general differences between methods was small, but those methods gave a bit more focused areas. Uh, so that, yeah, that would definitely be also a good method to look into, but I used uh, guided back propagation. Maybe something a little bit out of scope, but how do you see, of course, it's a different kind of technology to measure uh, different signals and this surface. But the, the F nearest the functional near infrared spectroscopy, so that is, for example, uh, available as mobile tools. Uh, do you see that there will be also something in this direction, or is it not really far away from the quality of data that you have there in the? Yeah. So I must admit that it's a bit outside of my expertise, so I, do, I don't know the details about that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, so I cannot really say much. Mm -hmm. but if, uh, but I think that, so. MRI isn't, of course, not portable and not uh, yeah, limited to centers that have a good MRI scanner. So I think there is, regulations, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah, so there, there is definitely a, uh, interest in other techniques. Yeah. OK, thank you so much. Uh, uh, stop. Uh, ah, there's another question by the same. Which paper of yours should I read into in order to know more about these relevant score significance maps? Thank you again for answering my question. Um, so for the SVM significance maps, um, I have a paper. Uh, oh, where is it? Maybe a little bit later, you can put it into the yes. chat. Would be yes, great. I can uh, put the link in the chat. That's maybe Super, easy. super. Yes. So, Okay, then thank you so much uh, for the great uh, talk. Uh, and uh, now we will switch to the next one. Okay. Yes, thank you. So. I'll prepare the next one. One second. So the next talk is uh, given by Professor uh, Dr. Guillermo Maria de Oliveira Wood, uh, and he obtained his PhD at Technical University in Aachen, worked as a postdoc at uh, Paris Lodron University uh, of Salzburg, and is now a full professor of neuropsychology at the Institute of Psychology at the University of Graz in Austria. 
Professor Wood does research uh, in cognitive psychology, brain computer interfaces, neuropsychology, and differential psychology. And this current project focuses on predictors of neurofeedback training. Uh, the talk uh, that he is giving now uh, is about brain changes uh, induced by a VR uh, based mindfulness training. So uh, enjoy the talk. Greetings to everybody. My name is Guilherme Wood, and today I will show you a, a small study uh, we conducted. So me and uh, uh, colleagues from um, uh, a cooperation group, uh, uh, and particularly so Sylvia Kober uh, uh, was very important so for uh, the conduction of, of these measurements. And so today I will talk a bit about uh, brain changes which can be induced by a virtual reality based uh, mindfulness training in uh, healthy uh, typical participants as well as in uh, dementia uh, patients to present you our results so i have to start by describing uh, the the measurement uh, technique we used uh, to record uh, brain activation, and this was electroencephalogram. So if you're not familiar with this technique, so uh, you can see on these pictures, so we can place electrodes uh, on the scalp of people and record uh, uh, electrical activity. In this case, because you are measuring from outside and only with a few electrodes, you uh, don't have a very uh, high uh, spatial resolution for your signal. Nevertheless, uh, you can reach uh, with EEG a wonderfully high uh, temporal resolution, which is very important to characterize specific um, uh, cognitive processes in the brain and differentiate between uh, healthy and unhealthy uh, mental states. And so how does uh, EEG work? So it measures uh, the summated electroactivity of the brain over the scalp uh, by recording the, the, the voltage fluctuations you can uh, record on the surface of the head. The raw EEG can be decomposed in different uh, frequency bands, so uh, you can filter the signal to extract uh, uh, only particular, particular uh, frequency bands. Um, and these frequency bands are characterized by their uh, frequency as well as by typical amplitudes. We have uh, slower rhythms uh, like the delta and the theta uh, rhythm, so you see here so typical recordings in these um, frequencies so measured here so this is the length of one second you can see so how the the the, the, the signal changes in these specific frequencies as well as so uh, in higher frequencies like uh, alpha and beta and also so beyond beta we also have uh, other relevant uh, rhythms uh, we are not to talk about them today so particularly the alpha rhythm uh, is for us uh, very important today because it conveys us information about uh, uh, the, the, the state of uh, uh, wakefulness and uh, relaxation as well as um, so the property of the brain so to actively uh, inhibit uninvolved brain regions when they are not necessary and so this is a, a wonderful capacity we have so to uh, turn down activation in brain regions which are not necessary to cope with the task at hand and particularly when we are doing nothing so just trying to relax and uh, we do not think of anything uh, uh, specific uh, very hard then uh, so we will see uh, typically a lot of alpha and this is good so uh, in dementia patients we observe for example uh, uh, a decrease in the amplitudes of this rhythm and this uh, is related so to a failure uh, in this inhibition process for example which uh, um, contributes to to decrease the the, the coordination of thoughts and so the the uh, voluntary aspect of tuning of cognitive um, cognitive uh, resources to, to to solve problems in, in daily living. Yes, uh, in previous studies, as I just told you, 
uh, we can see that particularly in the alpha rhythm, so alpha one and alpha two are two subbands of this uh, alpha uh, uh, rhythm. And we can see that in mild cognitive impairment as well as in Alzheimer's disease, uh, the distribution of the alpha rhythm is less pronounced, so uh, uh, to a, a, a smaller extent in mild cognitive impairment and to a larger extent in Alzheimer's disease. So something is happening there, uh, which is hampering uh, these inhibition uh, uh, processes I just described to you. Uh, and with a compare uh, the brain's uh, uh, the brain activity in other frequency bands, so uh, changes related to dementia are not as pronounced as in the alpha rhythm. So this is why we focus on this rhythm today. And our research question is uh, very simple. So can uh, virtual reality based mindfulness training increase alpha activity in the EEG? in people without dementia uh, as well as in people with dementia um, and to investigate that uh, we conceived a experimental design in which uh, so after uh, people gave their uh, informed consent so we mounted the EEG uh, system on their heads and recorded um, uh, EEG for uh, short episodes so in this case, three, uh, there were uh, three different uh, EEG recordings, so a baseline before people were uh, asked uh, so to, to, to fill some questionnaires, uh, uh, which we collected in, in this particular study. And uh, then we proceeded to, to a pretest, which was an EEG recording just before starting this training with uh, the, the virtual reality interaction. Uh, uh, build it to, to uh, promote uh, mindfulness. And after 20 to 30 minutes interaction with the system, we recorded EEG again. So just for, for uh, short periods of time. So just to uh, have a look when people are not doing anything in particular, uh, how those uh, their EEG uh, recordings look like. And at the end, there were uh, uh, more questionnaires uh, to be filled. And uh, so this is the experimental design. Um, and particularly important are for us, so changes in the uh, uh, EEG rhythms, uh, particularly uh, so the, the, in the alpha rhythm, and also uh, the connectivity uh, we can observe uh, between uh, different electrodes. So the, the, the higher the connectivity, so uh, the, the, the more similar is the activity in all these electrodes and particularly when you are doing nothing you want uh, that your uh, brain is really uh, doing nothing specific any part of it is doing anything specific and you expect uh, an increase in uh, the coherence so and um, in the pilot study so we just uh, tested so how this uh, um, uh, uh system would work so the the virtual reality um and we compared so younger participants which um yeah have uh, probably more familiarity with uh, uh high-tech products and uh, with uh, vr and we which are also so a bit more uh, resilient than than older people and so can um, um, stand uh, these EEG measurements. So as a first approach uh, uh, to, to the whole measurement, so then we compared both of them and uh, um, we uh, could uh, find out that, so the EEG we recorded uh, was not really a problem so for uh, older participants and so that they could stand that as well as younger people. And this is good because, so the applicability of uh, these methods uh, later on depends on, yeah, so uh, how much effort you have to put on there and uh, so how um, uh, much effort participants have to, to put in that. And so uh, it uh, proved to be so quite uh, useful. And uh, so people in, in all age groups accept that as uh, so really well. And in this uh, pilot study, we used a, a GTEC uh, amplifier for EEG recordings. We have there so the uh, uh, possibility to uh, 
uh, record more channels as we see here so over the scalp of a person so we recorded then uh, 12 uh, electrodes with a, a, a reference and um, uh, it takes a bit longer uh, than the system we will see in the main study and this was on purpose so just to, to test the, the upper bound of uh, um, effort uh, you can put on, on these measurements and everything worked uh, really nicely so I can show you some results that um, uh, so we can see here uh, in older participants and in younger participants uh, color coded the the intensity of uh, the upper alpha power over uh, so the, the the 12 electrodes and you can see um, that uh, after uh, the vr based uh, mindfulness training the eeg alpha activity was higher than before in both groups so you can see that in, in older participants, so you see uh, um, uh, a change of intensity uh, over here in older participants as well as in younger participants, so that uh, it increased as well um, uh, from the pretest to the post test. So this is, is a very nice result and a good message uh, which motivated us for the main uh, study. Oops, yes. And in the main study, we compared then uh, only older people, uh, 12 elderly people uh, without dementia and 12 elderly people uh, with dementia. And in this case, uh, we adopted so a much uh, simpler uh, setup, only with uh, three channels uh, mounted on the head and a more portable uh, amplifier. So just to uh, keep uh, things uh, simple. This kind of electrode here is also uh, easier to, to, to mount than the other ones and uh, uh, have still so a very good quality um, for uh, data generation. And uh, this is why we use that. So this Nexus uh, system, uh, it has capacity for more electrodes. So three electrodes uh, placed uh, anteriorly at the center line and more posteriorly. So this is enough for a demonstration of uh, a proof of principle. And uh, what do our results uh, show us? So um, when we compare uh, older participants without dementia with those with dementia, we validate uh, previous studies so that um, uh, participants without dementia show stronger uh, upper alpha activity uh, than uh, patients with dementia. This is what we expected. So this only shows us that the uh, people uh, we measured uh, with a diagnosis of dementia also show the, the EEG signature uh, typical of uh, dementia. And it applies to uh, the power of upper alpha uh, EEG measured uh, with eyes uh, open, as well as uh, uh, for the upper alpha co coherence in the activity between these electrodes. So the more anterior, the central and the more posterior one. And we see that the connectivity is also higher in uh, uh, typical participants, what also uh, validates the, the, the literature and uh, points out so that uh, dementia patients have more uh, problems with inhibition processes, which are yeah uh, described by the, the power and coherence in upper alpha. Uh, activity. But more important are the results of this uh, virtual reality based intervention and this uh, I will show you now. Um, yeah, so the intervention of uh, 20 to 30 minutes is sufficient to increase uh, the upper alpha power in both older participants without dementia, as we can uh, uh, see here, as well as in participants uh, with dementia. And this, these are great news as well. So the uh, participants after this short interaction show similar uh, improvements as we can see in uh, older participants uh, without dementia. 
so the, 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 the mechanisms of action, so to induce uh, uh, mindfulness and uh, uh, relaxed uh, mental state in these participants, uh, seems to work in a similar way uh, regardless of uh, the, 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 the presence of dementia. And this is really good because uh, it suggests uh, this system will be useful uh, for uh, use in the, the rehabilitation or management of uh, 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 cognitive decline and uh, general health uh, of uh, uh, dementia uh, patients. Because so mindfulness uh, practice uh, have a, a positive uh, uh, effect on, on, on these aspects. So uh, these are results from the literature. Yes, and here I can show you uh, also so the, the, the results on the coherence. In this case, so the, the, the change in coherence we can see in older participants, it's not in upper alpha, so it is lower alpha, uh, but still, uh, so the, the, the results are comparable uh, in both uh, participants uh, without and with dementia. So we observe from pre-test to post-test in both cases an increase in uh, coherence, which is compatible with the, the general, general effectiveness of this uh, virtual reality-based uh, mindfulness training. Yes, so the take-home message uh, from this study is that uh, virtual reality-based uh, mindfulness training can lead to short-term changes in brain activity because so we cannot uh, we can only speculate about uh, how uh, 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 durable uh, this, these changes can be. Probably with uh, just a short intervention, results are not uh, as strong as uh, with uh, longer interventions, but this is a matter for uh, further studies. And yes, yeah, so the use um, uh, are corroborated by these uh, uh, results I, I just presented to you. Yeah, before I thank you very much for your attention, I uh, want to uh, uh, draw your attention to a, um, uh, a new curriculum uh, for a, a master, which uh, will be offered uh, starting probably uh, in um, the winter of uh, 2021. It's called Computational Social Systems. And so if you liked uh, my talk and so this um, general approach to the, the problem of investigating uh, cognitive uh, 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 processes in uh, patients and typical uh, participants, as well as uh, uh, so the combination of uh, uh, high technological uh, devices. So to promote uh, increase in, in cognitive abilities and uh, or at least so maintenance of a, a certain level of uh, function in, in daily living, which we can promote uh, with mindfulness training. Uh, so you will uh, perhaps like to, to study uh, these topics and because so this is uh, uh, one of the core topics we will offer on uh, this uh, master uh, studies. So the development of such uh, uh, high technological uh, interventions for diagnostics and uh, uh, therapy um, uh, in the future. So stay tuned and uh, look at our uh, 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 web page uh, in the future. So if you are interested on uh, study uh, computational and social systems. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, I would like to thank so much uh, Professor Wood for these uh, interesting insights into uh, VR-based intervention, mindfulness training. We are also interested in that. Uh, you can see uh, in demonstration number five in the afternoon, uh, some more aspects uh, there. Uh, if you're interested, Professor Wood is unfortunately not available. Uh, so, uh, I see uh, two questions. Uh, there are also Brazilian greetings, are very nice. 
please uh, direct your question to the um, email address. Uh, it was on the video, but I will put it into the chat uh, just uh, slightly afterwards. Yeah. Um, okay, so now then I would like to give over uh, the chairing to uh, Sandra Schüssler to introduce the next talk. And uh, yeah, please, I give over to you. So our, our next keynote is by Professor Bettina Hüsebo. She is professor at the University of Bergen in Norway at the Department of Public Health and Primary Care. She is the leader of innovation at this department and she's a member of the group of artificial intelligence at the university. Furthermore, she is the head of the Center for Elderly and Nursing Home Medicine. And her clinical research is between technology and innovation, dementia, psychometric properties, and complex intervention studies. So now we start the presentation. Dear friends and colleagues, thank you so much for this kind invitation. This is really amazing to participate in this digital conference. My name is Bettina Hüsebö. I'm a professor at the University of Bergen related to the Department of Global Public Health and Primary Care. And I'm the head of the Center for Elderly and Nursing Home Medicine at the University. I am also the leader for innovation at the department and member of the group for artificial intelligence. I want to talk about assistive technology for home dwelling people with dementia during COVID-19. And I prepared um, a presentation for you and um, want to start with some prerequisites for our research. I'm an anesthetist and intensive care physician, and I have a specialization in palliative care and in nursing home medicine. And now I'm working with people with dementia, earlier more related to nursing home medicine, but now uh, also in people, in home dwelling people with dementia. So recently, or uh, in the last week, actually, we had a presentation at Harvard University, McLean, at the TIPS conference, and we presented this poster. And this is the main content of my uh, presentation now, because we talked about the access to and interest in assistive technology for home dwelling people with dementia under COVID-19. Um, Dementia is a huge topic in US, in Europe, in the rest of the world. And uh, this presentation was given at the Technology and Psychiatry uh, Summit, online summit. But uh, before starting, greetings from Norway in summer and winter, by day and by night. And this is the polar light in the north of Norway in winter time and winter time is just starting here and since we all have these travel restrictions we are more in our country country unfortunately i would really love to be in austria today so dementia and multimorbidity is a huge global challenge and I want to ask you whether you know these uh, reports from the World Health Organization or Alzheimer's Society about these topics, because these uh, reports always mention the advantage to you develop assistive technology for these people, not as an only solution, but as a support for staying safe at home. 
This is Lydia. Lydia is a typical patient in a Norwegian nursing home. She's a woman, she is old, and she has dementia. Dementia is not an unavoidable consequence of aging, but it is more based on multimorbidity and complex multifactorial diseases. Of course, age is the strongest risk factor, but only 10, about or less than 10% of all people with dementia have a genetic um, cause for the disease. Most dementia diseases are related to multimorbidity. And if we are doing right, we can reduce the risk for dementia with up to 40%. So there is a high prevalence of dementia in Europe, 10 million people. This will increase in future to 45 million people. And uh, around the world, we expect more than 130 um, cases by 2050. And if you take a look on the figure, you recognize that the largest increase in dementia prevalence is expected for the low and middle income countries. So we expect a lot of people in future. It's about uh, dementia, it's, it is about reduced life expectancy, reduced mental and physical function, behavioral disturbances such as agitation, aggression, apathy, depression, motor behavior disturbances, sleep disturbances, eating disturbances. And about 90% of all people with dementia will experience some kind of these behavioral disturbances during the course of their disease. So every patient has expected about four to five uh, relatives around him. So uh, the burden for the family is quite high here because they experience the disease over uh, several years, up to 20 years, 10 years before they receive the diagnosis and 10 years with this diagnosis. So the burden is high for the patient, the relatives and our society. Uh, in Norway, we tried to, solution, to, to find solutions for these challenges by focusing on nursing homes. We have about 900 nursing homes with uh, about 40,000 uh, beds for 5 million inhabitants. This means that a lot of people with dementia are living in a nursing home. We have about 100,000 people with dementia. Most of them have behavioral disturbances and multimorbidity. But most of the people with dementia are living at home. And um, on the other hand, um, about, uh, on the other hand, when they, when they um, are in the final state of their dementia, they usually get a place in a nursing home. And uh, more than 90% of the people with dementia are dying in a nursing home. So, um, as mentioned, uh, only few uh, people have a genetic cause for dementia. Most people have uh, dementia based on multimorbidity. And here are some causes for dementia. For instance, heart diseases, hypertension, um, stroke, diabetes, or depression. Loneliness, depression are um, risk factors for developing dementia. And only 5% of those with dementia 
do not have any multimorbidity. So this is a very important um, thought for the future dementia direction or prevention of dementia. Multimorbidity is causing polypharmacy and people in nursing homes have often use often or eight or more drugs uh, and drugs on demand, antidepressants and of course medication which is CNS active like serotiras and um, uh, psychotropic drugs, antidepressants, um, opioids. Uh, and this combination has often side effects worse than the dementia state. For instance, uh, Lydia says, uh, I received these pills because they want me to stop crying since my husband died. So many people receive anti-depressions uh, uh, without good effects and more side effects. So we have to be careful. Mm, and these ideas are um, important information when we are talking about sensing technology and um, uh, welfare technology for these people. Um, I am a pain therapist and I have a very high focus on pain assessment in people with dementia. And uh, we recently investigated the analgesic drug use in Norwegian nursing homes. And we uh, observed that from 2000 to 2011, the consumption of analgesics in nursing homes increased from uh, 35% to almost 60% of the patients who receive um, analgesics over a long time and often with a non, um, with an um, incomplete or ineffective um, result. So, uh, in, during my work as a researcher at the University of Bergen, um, we developed a uh, pain assessment instrument, the MOBI2 pain scale, uh, to assess pain in people with dementia who are no longer able to report their suffering. Uh, MOBI stays for mobilization, observation, behavior, intensity in dementia. And it's a two-part uh, pain assessment instrument tested and implemented for staff working in the nursing home. And it is implemented in more than 300 Norwegian nursing homes and it's translated and used all over the world for clinical trials, pain trials, including people with dementia. But in future, I hope that we will develop technology which is able to assess in one way pain and pain relief or the effect of pain treatment in these people because um, despite of these developments to use such type of tools we need actually more objective measures to assess pain to assess behavioral disturbances to assess depression and especially the effect of the treatment uh, when we address or when we try to address uh, these circumstances. So my, um, in, the, in the starting point of my career, uh, I was more engaged in pain assessment and pain treatment um, of people with dementia. But um, when I visited the nursing homes, they said, okay, this is a very important point. Pain is very important, but we are more interested in the lack of communication in these people and how can we assess uh, their wishes when uh, they are admitted to the nursing home. So the next focus was advanced care planning, the preparing communication with these people early in uh, during the stage of their disease, the early uh, discussion of their wishes. Then we know that they use too much medication. Medication review is another very important topic of our research. And then, of course, the activities. Because uh, we, we register that they use too much medication. Um, 
with interactions between all these drugs without effect. Uh, they are still in pain, they do not receive the, the right communication and so far. So we need more activities. And this combined is the intervention, the multi-component intervention of the COSMOS study, a multi-center cluster randomized control trial to improve the quality of life in nursing home patients. And we almost published um, 25 articles around this study. And we uh, recognize that they are old, they are women, they have dementia, they have a lot of diagnosis, they take a lot of drugs, a lot of drugs on demand, they have a lot of behavioral disturbances, and more than 40% are in pain despite the pain treatment. And by this multi component intervention, the quality of life improved, they had less drugs, less depression, less agitation, but better appetite, better activities of daily living, and the staff was less stressed. Very important. Formal, informal caregivers, really important. So this is uh, the overall article to this topic. And I mention all this because these are the prerequisites why we should focus on innovation and technology. Because these topics are just subjects or are very unsure. They are depending on staff competence and so far. So we need more um, objective measures in this area. Uh, when we worked in the nursing home, we also recognized that people do not want to come to the nursing home. Most elderly people in Norway want to stay at home as long as possible and even die there. Um, but dementia is not curable and they have multimorbidity, polypharmacy, the disease is very expensive and there is a discontinuation in the coordination between um, uh, the duties uh, from the primary and the secondary healthcare service and the home care services and of course nursing homes. So we actually um, conducted the live at home pathway study. This is a randomized or a stepped wedge randomized control trial with a multidisciplinary approach. And LIV is an acronym for learning and education, innovation or ICT, volunteers and empowerment. And empowerment is the fact that we conduct advanced care planning and medication review. And this is a mixed method study with qualitative and quantitative elements, with registry um, studies, a pilot, and quantitative measures about cost benefit, quality of life, pain, neuropsychiatric symptoms, sleep measures, and we assess the relatives and circumstances around the relatives. But the main intervention, the main um, multi-component intervention for home dwelling people with dementia is more knowledge in form of learning, innovation, volunteers and empowerment. Oops. And here we are again, <laughs> I fall out a little bit. Uh, this is a huge uh, collaboration project between the three largest cities in, uh, or one of the three largest cities in Norway, Berum, Bergen, Kristiansand, and um, collaboration partners from the UK, the Netherlands, 
Japan and US. And the aim is to develop, test and implement a complex intervention resulting in a clinical pathway that will support home dwelling people with dementia and their families intended to reduce caregivers burden which will lead to beneficial effects for to stay safely longer independently at home with cost effectiveness. And this is a two year stepped wedge randomized controlled trial with a pilot study. And we include people with dementia, biomemory teams, geriatric poly, uh, out clinics and municipalities. We have a coordinator um, who is implementing or several coordinators who are implementing the multi-component intervention at home. And we have regular telephone contact with the people. So, and this is the timeline of the um, stepped wedge cluster randomized trial. So, at baseline, all people were included about uh, 330 uh, dyads as patients plus relatives. And to, twice a year, we have the data collection, uh, in total FEM time data collection for all included people. The green lines are the implementation of the complex intervention in the three cities. Christian Sun, Beron, Bergen, each time about 100 people. And then we conduct uh, midwife evaluations. So um, I want to talk about the innovation part in this study because elderly people do not want to come to the nursing home. And this is Jorun and she is living at home. She is almost 90 years old and she is on Facebook with her, with, uh, her 15 grandchildren and nine grand grandchildren. So this is a new generation who wants to make their own decisions. Sensor technology uh, or um, we have all possibilities for sensor technology. It exists, but um, we published recently a review article about sensor technology for people with dementia, and we recognize that most of these technologies are not developed and validated and implemented for these people living at home. And there are only very few uh, studies, but these studies are based on small sample sizes. So this was a timeline uh, for our live at home study. Um, we started in April 2019, but when it comes to March to, uh, 2020, uh, Corona arrived in Norway as well. And we had to, in one way, we had to rethink and we had to stop this study because we were no longer able to visit our people at home. So it was important to think new. Here is a flowchart in the beginning, uh, pre pandemic. We um, enrolled 438 dyads, uh, 157 were excluded. Then we included finally 281 patient relative dyads. And we had the first follow ups with uh, 237 um, live dyads. And this was in December 2019. Then when the COVID-19 um, um, catastrophe come to, came to Norway, we started a sub-study. Uh, the name was PAN-DEM. 
pandemie in dementia. And we randomly uh, invited 137 um, diets to participate in this pandem study. So the aim of pandem was to describe pre-pandemic access to assistive technology for home-dwelling people with dementia, to explore whether the COVID-19 restrictions increased the caregiver's interest in assistive technology, and to identify factors associated with increased interest. This was a great opportunity for us to assess the effect of COVID-19 for home-dwelling people with dementia. We used and extended the live at home pathway to include the pandem cohort when the restrictions interfered with the trial protocol. Out of the 438 diets, assessed in May 2019, we telephone interviewed 126, randomly invited. And this was between March and May 2020. So, what did we find? We actually found that about 70% of those living at home with dementia have some kind of assistive technology but this is unfortunately only traditional old technology such as stove guard and safety alarm this is not gps it's only safety alarm and stove guard the modern assistive technologies do not exist in Norway at home for home dwelling, living, uh, home dwelling people with dementia. The point is that we have a lot of technology, we use a lot of technology, but it is not implemented in, for these people. So the mean age of these people were 82 years, 61% um, were female, 30% lived at home, 15% operated telephones independently, 74 partly, 11% uh, uh, did not use the telephones. Only two were on Facebook, one on Skype. 52% uh, had caregivers, um, um, uh, 52% of the caregivers were children. Compared to COVID-19, 40% of the caregivers were more digital and had a better telephone communication. But 27% reduced or no contact. And interestingly, only 17% had an increased interest for assistive technology. So we conducted adjusted logistic, logistic regression uh, models and we saw that caregivers to people with better MMSE score, uh, this means less dementia, and less familiar in using um, telephone calls, were more interested in technology. So this means that people who are less able to use the telephone are more interested in alternative um, technology. So when we discuss this topic, so can we uh, conclude, most have access to any assistive technology, while only a few operate novel technologies. Caregivers interest in new technology did not increase much under COVID-19. 
caregivers consider technology as an obstacle rather than a tool for independence in adapting to the pandemic situation. And I think that it's very, very much about the next generation. It's about us. It's about it's less about the generation who is now living at home with dementia. And perhaps it might be a women perspective because most are women, most receive uh, support and care by women from the home care service. And um, in the same way, most um, caregivers in nursing homes are women. And those who are developing these um, technologies and implementing these technologies are often men. So I, I'm afraid that we have a gender perspective and that we need a lot of communication and uh, education to make a change. Working with these um, issues of technology, welfare technology, assistive technology in people with dementia, we have to be aware that we need patient public involvement. And again, this is a women perspective. We have to include elderly women and we have to, to give education to, um, to healthcare staff and so forth. And we have to include the home care nurses in the development and the implementation of these devices. We need responsible research innovation because um, in connection with dementia at home and technology, there are a lot of ethical issues. How do we store the data? How do we collect the data? How do we collect informed consent and so forth? So we have to be aware that GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, uh, manifested in the new EU regulation uh, framework, and the DPR, the Data Protection Impact Assessment. It's about data storing. Yes, I, I have the feeling in the very end that there is a huge potential for research and developing topics. It's about method development. It's about development of um, technology. It's about a huge number of clinical data. It's about big data. It's about education and education programs. It's about at home and in the nursing home. And finally, Greetings uh, from my Center for Elderly and Nursing Home Medicine. We are working with research, education, implementation, and national and international collaboration. And we are uh, collaborating and working together with uh, Lucas Paletta. And I want to thank you for good work and collaboration. So I hope we will continue with this also in future. And greetings from Norway and my team at the Center of Elderly and Nursing Home Medicine at the University of Bergen. Thank you so much for your attention. Thanks you very much for this great presentation. It's very interesting and we need this information here from these uh, big problems. And I think it was a very good idea to start with this special small study. And it's not small, you have 174 people, so it's not so small, but and very interesting. So do you have uh, some experience about the people with dementia, about their feeling to use technology? Do you know something about this in this small project? Mm. Uh, we did not. Also, good morning, if, uh, Sandra. Nice to see you. Very nice to see you, Lucas, as well, and the whole team Hi, right. who is uh, following this uh, amazing Congress. Congratulations with this Congress. It's the first in 
Yes, in artificial intelligence in dementia, and this is really great. Um, we, uh, Sandra, to your question, we unfortunately did not yet interview these people with dementia, how they feel when they should use um, technology. Um, as I mentioned, uh, interestingly, the uh, interest in technology did not really increase during uh, COVID-19. And I'm afraid that the interest um, in these people with dementia and their relatives is not um, such as high um, when they are living at home. I suggest that this is a generation uh, which is not really used to, uh, to use these uh, advantages of technology, iPhone, for instance, or uh, fall detectors or um, GPS and so far. I, I have the feeling that this may be a women perspective. Elderly care is very much a women perspective. And um, we need a lot of education to inform uh, healthcare providers, staff, uh, female staff, and elderly people to get more used to uh, recognize the advantages related to this support. I really have the feeling that we need uh, some kind of new generation. When we are starting with these elderly who are now living at home with dementia, perhaps um, these actions may be uh, too late. I, I'm, um, I'm interested in your uh, experience uh, with the, the inclusion of very old people with dementia living at home. Are they very eager to use this technology? I don't know, but uh, the next generation perhaps. It's, it's our generation, I yes. suggest. We will be very open for for using these uh, devices. I think we have the same situation in Austria that people with dementia do not use these new technologies like communication mm -hmm. apps. And mm -hmm. we also have this situation with the nursing staff that they also mm -hmm. not use these communication apps or other new technologies, only mm -hmm. the old one or the, yes. Mm -hmm. And I have seen that in Germany, they have um, standards, they have uh, small guidelines mm -hmm for mm. digital competence. Do mm. you have this in your country? Such, do you know something about this, if there are? Digital competence? Yes. Uh, guidelines. I, I know that the government had a very high focus on the development of welfare technology for the last 10 years. And they used a lot of uh, resources, uh, both to establish the idea, to make platforms, to support Gründerbedrifter uh, to develop these devices, um, to support response centers and so far. But in one way, the implementation failed. Um, they did not include home care services as use in user panels, and they did not include uh, staff, nursing home staff in these user panels. We are talking very much about um, user involvement and implementation in research uh, projects, but in the very end and in practice, it uh, doesn't happen. Not yet, I, I, I hope, but um, people who should use it should be included in the whole process of the development of the idea, production, user-friendly outfit, and so far. And then the implementation and testing in the very end. But in Norway, we, until now, we failed uh, in this direction. We, so we, we, I'm sorry, what do you say? We also have the, the same problem. So yeah. we have the aim that we increase digital competence in hmm. nursing staff, but also in other people in the hmm. general population. But hmm. this is an aim and we have no guidelines at the moment, but I think we will have it in the future. And hmm. 
I think we have to, to work together, multidisciplinary, it's so important. And, and you work also in this direction, and I think this is great. Bettina. Mm. And uh, uh, we, we should get used to it that we ask what is important to you, what do you need, how, um, how do you experience this to use it, and so far. It's, it's these questions uh, which you had uh, in the beginning, Sandra. Um, but uh, we, we, we did not succeed until now. Actually, we are planning a study with the inclusion of people with Parkinson's disease living at home. And this will be a huge part of the project to ask them, what do you need? How do you feel? What is important for you? And so far, we should begin, we should start there. Yes, we should start. <laughs> okay, there is one stated question here. If you have used an art therapy in your project in general. Art, ther art, art therapy? Art, yes. Mm, this is very, very interesting. Music therapy, art ther uh, therapy. Um, I, I know that uh, people in the municipality of Bergen are starting this perspective uh, about art therapy. And I was invited uh, in this group, but I did not feel uh, competent. But I think that this is very, very important. Um, we, um, we have established art therapy in nursing homes, not related to this project, which I just uh, presented, or these projects. But um, in this project, I know that um, nursing home patients uh, were included in uh, museums and they were for instance, um, uh, ask about their experiences when they um, viewed uh, pictures from Munch. And this, um, this end up in a PhD project. And if there are some interests for this, I could provide you with the name of the lady who conducted this PhD project. We also earlier tried to collaborate with our department of art and music, and we have some smaller projects, but I'm not really involved in this because I'm not good at it. So you, you, um, you should feel a, a close connection to the topic. And then I suggest that you can make a very good word, but I'm not the right person related to this. So, but uh, there are actions in at the University of Bergen related to art and related to music, and I can make the contact if um, if this uh, could be relevant. Mm -hmm. I think so. We had the experience about music for people with dementia, mm. but it is very important. They love mm. music, yes, and yes. They like to dance. So, I think this is a very uh, a very important topic, so very interesting. And hmm. it's in very... the live study, we also include an app for favorite music. But I do not, uh, we did not yet analyze uh, the data. So uh, probably there are some people who preferred this uh, music app. So thank you very much, Pedina. Thank you. Greetings to Krems and Graz. Very nice to see you. <laughs> it's great that we have you here and it's wonderful. You said everything so nice in context and so important to see that the technology will be dependent on so many factors, human factors and, mm. and requirements of the people. Uh, so I think it's uh, very important and, and uh, of course, uh, extremely interesting your uh, large size uh, field based experiments and so on. Hmm. Thank okay. you, Lucas. <laughs> okay, so, so have, a, have a super day. <laughs> <Okay>. Thank you. <laughs> and there's still something to come. 
uh, basically, we are now going a little bit into a lunch break, uh, difficult to <laughs> step uh, far away from the, from the symposium for some time. And at 1 p.m., uh, there will be another talk. And please don't miss it, because this is really uh, also something very interesting about the implementation by the Henrik Hauterblund, body and brain training with big data and AI for seniors with dementia. And that is something that is really realized and also with uh, scientific evaluation. So it's, it's a great talk and come again. And then also the whole afternoon, of course, will be interesting. Exciting. <laughs> thank you. OK, thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thank you. Uh, see you at 1 PM again. Yes, Bye. thank you. Bye. Bye.
I'm Professor Henrik Hauteblund of the Technical University of Denmark, and uh, I would like to thank you for watching in here. I'm going to talk today about the uh, body and brain
So welcome everybody uh, for the afternoon session. I hope everyone uh, had the opportunity to refresh oneself a little bit. In the afternoon, there will be uh, the focus on training and serious games. And I uh, just give over to Sandra, please. Uh, would you please chair the afternoon session? Thank you. Our next presentation is by Professor Henrik Hartrop Land. He is the head of the Center of Playware at the Technical University of Denmark. And he focuses on bringing play to everyone, including all the people with dementia. And he will now present the topic body and brain training with big data and AI for seniors with dementia. I'm Professor Henrik Hautzeblon of the Technical University of Denmark, and uh, I would like to thank you for watching in here. I'm going to talk today about the uh, body and brain training with big data and AI, and of course, especially for seniors with dementia. This is work that um, we have done over uh, some uh, years now, uh, and we have won uh, quite a few uh, prizes for this uh, lately. Um, some of this uh, that you can see here, but but let's get to to the real thing. So what we are uh, trying to look at is uh, is how can we help seniors, seniors with different difficulties. Take for instance this uh, old lady from uh, Malaysia. Um, she has wasted lower limb muscle uh, problems, and she couldn't stand up, and uh, had this uh, this uh, challenge that her daughter was going to be uh, having her wedding in Singapore a few weeks later. So she came to home Medicare and said she wanted to do some rehabilitation. And actually, after just five weeks of training, she was able to stand up and walk again and thereby be able to participate in her daughter's wedding. Another example we can look at is, uh, is this one. This is uh, Inga Bull from uh, from Denmark. She, uh, she had a similar story that... Uh, she, uh, she had uh, a stroke uh, in her case, and uh, she couldn't travel to visit her son uh, who lived in Thailand. And that's, of course, uh, was quite bad. Uh, so she started to train with this uh, motor tiles, playing around on these colored tiles that you see on the ground. Uh, and what she says uh, after a few weeks of uh, training was that she was able to, to travel to her son. And, and apart from that, especially that it feels liberating for her that she feels greater freedom. She can now go by herself to the bakery and grocery whenever it suits uh, herself. So she is independent of others. This is a big uh, quality for her now. Uh, a third example I just want to do before we go into to the other things is, uh, for instance, this lady, a uh, sclerosis uh, patient, uh, whom you can see playing with the motor tiles here. Uh, so uh, what um, what the doctors uh, found with uh, her playing around with this was uh, was first of all that she's very motivated and enthusiastic, uh, which is very important when uh, when we're talking about trying to do things with uh, with uh, people who have uh, difficulties. It's important for everybody that can we find things that really uh, motivates us to do the, the rehabilitation, if we're talking about that. And, and of course, apart from that, the more qualitative uh, uh, things in terms of uh, her health is that she, they found improved balancing and proprioception and improved ability of lateral movement uh, in, uh, and the left-right distinction in the case of this sclerosis uh, patient with uh, cerebellar ataxia. So the general uh, thing is that, that we can do um, effect studies, which we do, and find that in randomized control trials among seniors, average age 83 years old, that they improve their balancing uh, score with 150%. So think about that, 150%. And this is after merely five hours of play on the motor tiles. In this case, the randomized control trial would be two times of uh, training per week for uh, for 12 weeks. Each time they would be playing uh, for just 13 minutes on these uh, motor tiles. And by that, a total 
would be five hours, they would improve balancing uh, scores like this. And also things like mobility, agility, um, endurance, and so forth. And we do believe that apart from the quantitative measures we can do like that to see 150% improvement in balancing scores, the qualitative reason for why they are improving so much is that this is play. This is playful. This is fun. And, and play is important here because play is a free and voluntary activity that we do for no other purpose than play itself. So when we are in play, in play dynamics, we forget about time and place. And we can often do more than we, can, we would normally be able to do. Uh, so this is what we see uh, being playing out with, uh, with the things with the motor tiles is that we can motivate through play. And then, by the way, we can measure some things we would call the collateral health effects. So the, the foremost uh, purpose here is to create play. And if we are good at creating playful technology and play, then the effects will be I would say fairly easy for us to measure because the important thing is to create motivation amongst the seniors in this case. So we created this uh, motor tiles to bring happiness to life. Um, uh, for instance, we use this amongst uh, seniors with dementia in, uh, in Japan together with um, Seno Mizuno uh, who distribute the motor tiles there. You can see three different setups here just to show you the variety of way you can set things up. We have created these motor tiles as interactive tiles, pretty much like Lego blocks. So imagine this, you can build with this any kind of shape that you would like to. You can put it up anywhere. You can allow people to just put up a chair to hold on to if they need that, or put it inside the parallel walking bar. So it becomes something that's easily to transport to any senior, in this case with dementia, and for any uh, care worker to set up and uh, and to start playing with within seconds. So this is in the case you can see here where we're playing with individuals. We can also do social play. And uh, in this case from, uh, from Finland, they're playing this uh, music game. So you might be able to hear that when they press their tile, there's a sound coming out as well. But this is a group play between uh, seniors with dementia now. They can enjoy playing together with each other. Uh, and many uh, people like here, five or six, can play at the same time. Um, so we know that, um, in general, that the motor tiles play is effective. We have published this, and, and there's a, a couple of references here, uh, published this where we can see that there's a very high and fast effect on the, the, the physical things like uh, balancing, especially as I, as I talked about before, strength, mobility, endurance, and so forth. So the physical functional abilities of the seniors. And, and in this case, we're talking seniors who are average age, 83 years old. Typically, our experiments are with seniors between 70 years of age and uh, 96, 97 years of age. But what we have also done is that uh, together with uh, Noi, which is a spin-off from Hitachi in Japan, we have been looking at uh, brain training games for seniors. Uh, and, and what Noi is uh, doing is they have created this headband, uh, a, a wearable brain scanning device using near-infrared uh, spectrometry. And, um, they have uh, then used this together with seniors who are playing on the motor tiles, as you can see on the, on the photo here. So what they do is that they look at the brain activity here in the prefrontal cortex, which essentially can tell us something about the concentration. Uh, and then at the same time, also do pre and post tests with standard cognitive tests. And what they find is that there's a correlation between brain activity here and the score in the physical games on the motor tiles. And there's a significant improvement in the cognitive tests as well. Um, so 
for uh, training with uh, seniors with dementia, we can use this for both uh, the physical and the cognitive skills training. Like we're doing here in, uh, in Shanghai, this is at uh, Shanghai Isaohu, where they are training uh, seniors with, uh, with dementia and you get the feeling for what's happening here on, on the video. So what we did there in Shanghai was uh, we did a, a small uh, randomized control trial with um, two groups of uh, seniors with uh, dementia, an intervention group and control group. Uh, they played for the, the intervention group for two weeks uh, with the motor tiles and the control group played uh, what they would normally do, uh, board games and so forth. Uh, the motor tile uh, play was, uh, and the other play was uh, 30 minutes for five times per week uh, over uh, the weekdays. Uh, so a total of uh, 10 days over the two weeks, total of five hours of, uh, of training uh, in uh, two senior care homes under the Shanghai Isahu. Uh, and we did pre and post tests with uh, some cognitive tests like visual search and in back and, and so forth. Uh, and then the statistical analysis. And what we found was that there was significant improvement in the reaction time uh, and in the accuracy uh, of the NVAC test. So this is quite interesting because if we look at in general, what do we know from the literature about uh, traditional training, both for the physical skills and the cognitive skills of seniors? Well, we know from uh, systematic reviews that it will demand a minimum of 50 hours to get a significant effect. But on the other hand, we have just seen that with these experiments, both the physical and the cognitive improvements of the seniors, that when they're playing with the motor tiles, they do this in a tenth of this time, over just five hours, four to five hours, uh, typically. So we, this uh, has a much more rapid effect on the body and the brain. And as, as I uh, talked about before, this uh, we believe is due to the playfulness and the right design of uh, this playful technology of uh, the motor tile. So we create with the technology, this uh, technology mediates uh, a playful interaction, brings, pushes the, uh, the senior into a playful dynamics where they are forgetting about time and place and where they can suddenly do much more than they would normally do. They are not fearing anymore to do certain movements and, and to, uh, to see limitations in themselves. They're just uh, playing along. So this is uh, quite interesting, the effect on the body and the brain, um, because this means we can also think about uh, using this to do uh, a what we call a body and brain age test of, uh, of people uh, using, um, using uh, ideas from uh, AI and uh, big data. Now, uh, the, um, the idea here is that, uh, as, uh, as we sketch on one side here, is that uh, we can imagine we can do a small test on the motor tiles where seniors and others are jumping around, uh, playing uh, different games for two minutes. While they're playing these games, we can have the system to do a performance analysis. And uh, based on the performance analysis, do a risk analysis to see if there's any, any health risk uh, among them give a recommendation uh, based on that and create automatically a personalized training protocol, uh, giving automatically the games and duration and levels that they have to play. And then they will play this for a period of time. And then after, uh, say, uh, two or three weeks, they can take the test again and so forth. So in order to do so, uh, we... Um, we want uh, to be sure that uh, there's a correlation between the games that we're play having the seniors to play and uh, the results that we get from standard health tests to verify that this is a tool that we can use. So what we did to begin with was to make a study with uh, more than 50 seniors 
uh, and found that there is indeed a strong correlation between standard health tests and the uh, game score on the Mototiles uh, games. Uh, as we can, um, as we can uh, see here, uh, when we look at the standard health test cut points, they map to the exact same Mototiles game score. This, uh, when we look at, uh, for instance, time up and go, chair to stand and four square stepping test. We see that, uh, we know that if you score below a, a certain uh, threshold in this uh, test, you are at high risk of falling. If we map that over to what would the score be in different motorcycles games, as we have uh, named here, one game is color race, one game is special one, one game is final countdown. The mapping shows that we can see that if we play the color race game and people score below 19 points in that game, they will be at high risk of falling because we know there's a strong correlation between timed up and go and, and uh, the game score in color race. And we know that there's a certain uh, threshold in timed up and go uh, under uh, which you will have a high risk of falling. So we can map that over to the color race game. Now, further than that, we can start using big data and do big data analysis. Like here's just one example. Uh, these are from some users in Japan where we, we are collecting from, uh, from different countries. We have uh, here uh, on the x-axis, we have uh, the age of uh, the people playing. On the y-axis, we have the game score. And the numbers we see are number of people who are scoring in those particular ranges. So for instance, we can see that um, the um, people who are between 50 and 59, there are 49 of those who score between 20 and 25. What you can actually notice quite quickly here is that there's kind of a, a diagonal. Uh, so, um, so you can see that the older people get Obviously, you can say they're scoring lower, but but we can imagine now this is done with 411 people. Imagine we can do that with many more people, and we can start mapping this into the graph you see here, where we can see where the fitting result that uh, that the young people, the, the kids, are scoring a bit lower, and then when they come up to be uh, 25, 30, uh, they're kind of uh, peaking there, and then it goes gradually down. So. With this, you can imagine we can get the nominal score for your age. If you look at this here, you can see the fitting result. If we take one who's, um, who's uh, let's say, 80 years old, he is uh, supposed to score around uh, 14 uh, points. Now, imagine you are 80 years old. You play this game and you only score 10 points. Then we can probably say that this, there may be something there that we want to look into because you're scoring significantly lower than what the nominal score is. So using this, uh, and, and now I showed you one example from one game, we have the, this um, setup where they're playing four different games, as we can see on the left, color race, special one, final countdown, and remember. And then a, after two minutes, the system comes up with a score, what it is your body and brain aids. Then we can uh, look at the results, uh, press on that, and we can see uh, as mapped out here, and we can print this out to the senior. As you see on the right side, they get a small uh, piece of paper where it says what is your body and brain age, and, and look at the, the spider web where we can see uh, what is the score of your memory, your orientation, agility, speed, endurance, balancing, and uh, concentration. So you can see there where there are some, uh, maybe some problems. And then the system gives recommendations. So pretty much as, as uh, I showed before with this uh, diagram that we're doing performance, automatic performance analysis and risk analysis, and then the system uh, may give a recommendation. So the recommendation can come out in the form of if you press training here, then it generates the automatic training protocol that fits particular to you with the, the good things you have and the bad things you have in terms of, uh, of your performance. So for instance, in this case, it generates this uh, automatic protocol which says you have to play first uh, color race for one minute, then color race one minute, 
special one, one minute, special one, reads, reads, and final countdown. And you just have to press the play button. So it all runs by itself. It analyzes by itself. It generates the training protocol by itself. And it plays these games for you, so to speak, by itself, where you just have to interact and play the games. So for seniors with dementia, we did the effect test of this um, in Denmark over four uh, weeks training sessions with uh, the motor tiles. Uh, they were uh, playing seven minutes, uh, two to three times per week, a total of uh, one hour, you can say. Uh, and we did um, the pre and post test uh, with uh, this uh, body and brain test and found that there was improvement, a large improvement in, uh, in this uh, game scores. And specifically, we could see that they brought the seniors up to uh, or above the cut point for when they were at high risk of uh, falling, for instance. And uh, obviously, the, the therapist liked this because it's customized training and, uh, and it thereby targets what are the individual weaknesses. Um, as I say, we could uh, then look at the cut points there. Um, now, this is one example. Just uh, I took one, uh, one senior, a male here, and we can see the first test he did, uh, he got this uh, scores, uh, and then the system would generate an automatic protocol for him, saying that he had to play final countdown four times and Simon says three times. Then he did a test a week later, giving him new score, and the, the system would generate a new protocol for him with slightly different games because he had, uh, he had uh, improved on his, uh, for instance, in his speed, so he needed more of uh, um, other things like the, the memory games, so he did had to do more uh, special one color race and so forth. So we get this kind of end. And then finally, the, the results we can see was better for him uh, in the end. And this is for a male and this is for a female. You can see it's, uh, it can vary quite a lot, uh, obviously, what the individual uh, scores are and thereby also the individual protocols that will be automatically generated for these seniors with dementia. But the, the important thing is the system can then target the individual senior. And then you can bring this to the private homes of the seniors like this. And they can play the games. Um, and then, of course, we can bring them into other things like uh, playing cross-generational play with seniors uh, with dementia uh, being done in both uh, Hong Kong and Singapore, uh, like this. Or we, we can uh, do more individual play or group play, like, uh, like here in Finland, uh, different games, different uh, physical setups, uh, layout of the, of the tiles, and uh, get, um, for instance, like here, qualitative uh, reports from the seniors, some uh, saying, I, I, Earlier, I didn't trust my legs, but now I do. I manage at home without my cane. Uh, I'm a, a better mood at home and so forth. Uh, so, um, so with this, I will uh, will end here and say I, I do believe we can uh, use our efforts and technology to bring happiness uh, to life uh, for seniors with uh, dementia. And if you're more interested in all this, uh, please feel free to uh, contact me and uh, look at our website as well. We're always uh, happy to, to share uh, things with you and hope that we can collaborate in future. Thank you very much for listening. So thank you very much, Professor Land, for this very important topic, because I think Mobility is so important for the independent life for all people and not only for dementia. So I think it's one of the most important things. Um, in view of dementia, is it, uh, is it also possible to use it for moderate dementia, this training? Hello, uh, my name is Connor Buffel. I'm the scientific integration expert.
Sorry, can you repeat that? There was uh, some voice com com coming over. Would it be possible to use the training program for moderate the mantra? For moderating? Uh, yes, I, 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 would, uh, I would imagine so, uh, because we do see that uh, that um, that the dementia patients are, are really engaging in this a lot with uh, with uh, their own free will, and that's important here. That we do see that there's this uh, enjoyment happening there, and and while we at the same time measure these uh, these improvements, you can you can say that, that that is actually what we're doing with this. So 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 yes, I do believe so. Mm -hmm. And is this training program, is this performed by nursing professions or by physiotherapists? Well, well, well in, in, in fact, it's, it's, uh, it's performed by, uh, I would say, uh, say anybody who's at that particular institute. So, so we, this is being done in, uh, in uh, nursing homes. It's being done in, uh, in other uh, private care facilities. It's being done in hospitals. It's being done in the rehabilitation uh, centers. So, so, so obviously there you, you're talking a, a broad range of operators or mediators of this, uh, physiotherapists, doctors, care workers, uh, care workers with, I would say, with very li little um, education as well, uh, with, um, with seniors and family members themselves, even so, so we do see also in a, in a number of uh, nursing homes that they are trying to to after initiating the activities, they're bringing this more and more into operation of the seniors themselves. This is done so that anybody can understand using this within uh, less than a minute. Mm -hmm. Of course, with uh, with some of the dementia patients, it does need uh, operation. Uh, clearly enough, uh, it does. Uh, but uh, but you can even think of uh, of some of them being able to do some of the operation themselves. I think playing is so important, and that's <laughs> that's great. And I think we need much more um, assessments in this playful way. Yeah, and, and then you can say play. Play is important, and play is a uh, since it is something that you express from your own free will, and it's something that gives you enjoyment and life fulfillment. You can say it's it's even a requirement that we have to put that people should be allowed to play because it is a life quality, and if we don't give that opportunity to uh, also seniors with dementia then we are dep depriving them from something very significant. And I think it's a very good opportunity to assess really the problems because I think with the standard tests, mm -hmm. most often you have the problem that they, they know they are in a test situation and then you have not really the real picture of the person and not the real problems. And I think in a playful way, it would be easier I, I agree with you very much, Sandra, on this uh, this topic because it is we we have to think about if we want to assess people, we want to assess people when they are themselves, not in any artificial setting, which is uh, is what you're hinting to is is really that that we do often put people into some kind of a situation that where they are not themselves, and naturally so. Neither would you or me be if we are put into a test situation, but if we are just uh, playing, if we're doing something out of our own free will and, and it's something that we enjoy, then, then we just do it. And then maybe probably we get a much better picture of who we are, what are our, uh, our potential problems as well. So thank you very much. I think short question only. Sorry, yes, <laughs> extremely yes. interesting, Henrik. Thank you so much. <clears throat> I would just uh, maybe a short view on on this kind of training. You know, like uh, the, I've read this kind of color ray special one, so that this kind of specific components. It looks like the, your training is like uh, training these executive functions. So because then you have also this kind of, uh, um, let's say the um, the tests afterwards uh, in the short memory, shorter memory, yeah. and this kind of stuff. 
So can you just uh, uh, have, give a look a little bit, a short insight into this, uh, this kind of place, the small place or the, the yes. game? Yes, so 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 essentially we we have I, I can tell you a little bit because we have actually we have yeah. more than uh, you would imagine we have more than thirty five different games wow. for this uh, platform and and you you are hinting to three of them now right so so just to give you one very very simple one the one we call color race uh, imagine we are two people playing you are playing the blue color I see your background I'm playing the red color. So the when uh, one of the tiles slide up in red, I have to run over and catch that one. Mm -hmm. When I step on it, it jumps to another place. And you are at the same time catching the blue one, the one of us who first catches 10 uh -huh. wins the game. So that's okay. one, but, but we have designed also for, uh, for, the, for different things like brain training games and, uh, and so forth. So, so you can imagine we can, mm -hmm. we can easily uh, build new games, even if you uh, have ideas for different kinds of games, uh, I'm, I'm sure we can easily implement those and, and try to look at in collaboration, mm -hmm. what is the effect of different kind of games? How do they promote different mm -hmm. uh, qualities that we would be looking for? Extremely interesting. I uh, would love to. So sorry, Sandra, I was just too curious about it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay. There is a, another question. So here we have the questions about, do we have games to increase safety? Oh, yes, uh, that, that's, uh, that's uh, actually a good question because uh, essentially what is safety? I, I would say uh, that as, as I tried to show here, really the thing that we know that this is extremely good for dynamic balancing. This in itself uh, increases obviously safety. We know that uh, that uh, a third of seniors uh, will experience a fall over the next year, even above uh, 80 years of age, it will be one out of two who will experience a fall and, and that often leads to hip fracture and so forth. So, so there it's really important that we improve uh, things like the dynamic uh, balancing and not the static balancing, which you can you can do with things like Tai Chi and, and so forth. Here we, we are talking about the things that you do in your daily life, like uh, the dynamic balancing. And we know this is probably the best tool you have to improve uh, dynamic balancing. So that by itself will improve uh, safety. We do see this a lot with the, with the seniors uh, in the different places that they start out playing uh, where a care worker is holding their hand or Two, even two care workers holding uh, onto each side. After a week or two, they let go of one hand. After another week, they let go of the second hand. And, and by that, they be, uh, after a little while, they become so much more safe in their own walking. And that comes, it becomes a positive cycle. So, so the play on the motor tiles gives them this opportunity to understand that they are safe in their body. And that means that after the the playful session, after the training session, they will over the day, over the next few days, they'll start doing more and more in their own uh, room, their own apartment and so forth. And that goes into the positive cycle. So that's also one of the reasons why we can measure so good, um, good improvement is not only the training itself, but that the playful mood and the understanding of being safe in your body gives people the, the means to do things in their daily life, uh, which gives a lot of the improvement. So well, thank you very, very much. And yes, it's very- Thank you very much. Very good thank inspiration you. for our future. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. So now we have a presentation by Connor Buffel and Gerd van der Stichele. But if you have some questions, he is not here uh, today. But if you have some questions, Lucas will give the email address in the chat box and then you can directly ask your questions to Connor Buffel. So Connor Buffel is the CAO, uh, COO of MindBytes. This is a company developing digital therapeutics and educational tools. And Gerd van der Stichele is the founder and CEO of MindBytes. So now we start with the presentation. 
Hello, uh, my name is Connor Buffel. I'm a scientific integration expert with a uh, Belgian based SME called MindBytes. Uh, we also have a Canadian operations uh, where I'm based in Alberta uh, called MindLab Interactive AI. So I'm going to tell you a little bit uh, today about our web-based interactive educational tool to support people with dementia and their caregivers and uh, an explorative feasibility study that we perform to try and understand how artificial intelligence may provide some utility. So uh, today I'll talk a little bit about the objectives and framework we use to develop the uh, interactive educational tool or IET, the stakeholder feedback we've received thus far and the artificial intelligence objectives uh, associated, uh, some feasibility and remaining challenges and lastly and on questions. So the objectives and framework. Uh, so what, what is the problem that needs to be solved? What are we trying to do with this uh, IET? So uh, I think uh, most of the uh, listeners on the call will probably uh, be aware of this, but uh, caregiver burden is a real challenge uh, and, and a real problem in the area of dementia. So uh, there's some research that indicates uh, there's two to three family members of uh, each uh, individual with dementia that uh, experience some burden. Uh, and with the number of uh, individuals with uh, dementia rising around the world, so not just in, in certain countries or in a small number of countries, but globally, uh, that's a large, a very large number of family caregivers. And the family caregivers are really providing a exorbitant amount of time and uh, effort towards supporting uh, their loved ones. And um, there's uh, some 2014 uh, research that indicates uh, providing care to loved ones with dementia is costing an additional $9.7 billion uh, in the U.S. alone. So what does this caregiver burden uh, do for uh, to caregivers and people with dementia? Well, it results in psychological, uh, social, and economic uh, impacts, as well as psychosocial and clinical for the person with dementia. So uh, with that in mind, we believe there's a need for an intervention that empowers caregivers to deal with challenges and ultimately reduces burden. Uh, and ideally this intervention would be something that's uh, scalable and accessible uh, for, for many. So ideally something that's, that's digital. Uh, so our broader goal is uh, the uh, better life for people with dementia and their family caregivers. So we want to empower caregivers with new insights and really better equip them to deal with challenges. So we'd like to improve the quality of life uh, of caregivers and people with dementia, ensure greater harmony in the family, ensure that uh, people with dementia are respected and uh, support caregivers in feeling more competent in uh, providing care and uh, interacting with their loved ones. So the theoretical model uh, under which this IET is developed is self-determination theory. Self-determination theory is a uh, general psychological theory that uh, suggests, that postulates that there's three innate psychological needs, competence, autonomy, and relatedness. And when they're uh, satisfied or supported, it enhances one's self-motivation and their quality of life. And uh, in contrast, when thwarted or reduced, it, it diminishes motivation and quality of life. So uh, with this uh, IET, we try and uh, address and improve competence, autonomy, and relatedness, as well as uh, make family caregivers more aware of the relevance of competence, autonomy, and relatedness. And, and from that uh, perspective, uh, make them aware of self-determination theory. And ultimately what we're trying to do is to uh, support them in coping with challenges related to dementia and the perceived burden, as well as motivate them to continue caring for loved ones and continue coping with challenges. Uh, so how did we develop this tool? Uh, we developed it using the series framework, which is a published uh, and validated framework for the development of digital health tools. And uh, this framework uh, goes from uh, scientific evidence uh, and real life uh, interactions and, and uh, findings. So sort of ethnographic research to translate that into learning objectives and moving from learning objectives to game mechanics uh, or tool mechanics. And in the case of our IET, uh, that is through scenarios. So different uh, narratives that are common uh, to uh, caregiving uh, for people with dementia, as well as engine, uh, an engine to ensure that there's functionality of the tool and a design to ensure that the user interface is engaging 
and, uh, and, and interesting to, to look at. So the uh, different determinants or uh, barriers and drivers of uh, coping with, uh, with, with uh, burden of uh, interacting with people with dementia, or having loved ones with people with dementia, um, is uh, competence, autonomy, social functioning, family harmony, uh, and, and also on the caregiver side, competence and autonomy. So these are the findings from a, a literature review that uh, we performed and also through uh, some stakeholder uh, engagement that we've done. And we've tried to uh, translate that into scenario-based modules. So you can see at the bottom, uh, 10 different uh, stories, 10 different narratives uh, that we've uh, described. And you can see uh, within each narrative where the different determinants uh, are fitting. And we uh, use scenarios because uh, scenario-based modules facilitate the uh, ABC, the antecedents behavior consequences approach to problem solving. So in essence, uh, users are presented with a story or an antecedent. They uh, are asked to make a choice, so to perform a behavior. And then they see uh, the consequences of that behavior uh, through a qualitative feedback as well as semi-quantitative feedback. And then with that, they can better understand the uh, impact of different choices on uh, the situation uh, with themselves as, as a caregiver, as well as uh, the person with dementia. So in terms of the structural overview, uh, we have a home screen, um, we have a scenario introduction, uh, we have the dialogue that's presented as static visuals, uh, then the decision that I referred to, so a choice of three different options uh, based upon the option selected uh, the user receives some self-determination theory-based uh, feedback, as well as a tip that's specific to that scenario. Um, they go back uh, to this loop again and have two more uh, sequences of that. Um, they're then presented with their progress over those three scenarios, and they receive general recommendations about that storyline or that module. And then they return back to a module home screen where they can choose uh, one of the remaining nine modules to engage with. Uh, so our uh, series dementia tool is web-based and it's hosted on a custom online platform called a MOP, MindBytes online platform. Uh, so this platform is, uh, yeah, has, has a login page where participants have a username or password to log into and then uh, are arriving at uh, uh, a page in which they can interact with the IET. And then the IET itself is uh, built in Articulate 360, which is a e-learning uh, development software, generally speaking. And then when they uh, make certain choices within that, uh, through JavaScript, we're sending the uh, data flow through to a MySQL database. So we've collected some stakeholder feedback and we've uh, sort of postulated and, and uh, done some feasibility assessments on how artificial intelligence could try and address some of that. So we've done some co-creation with Belgian, Dutch and Austrian stakeholders. Uh, and here you can see an overview of the different type of uh, co-creation uh, methods we've employed. Uh, and you can see also we've done field tests with family caregivers, uh, 21 of them. And in total, we've uh, engaged with 79 different uh, stakeholders. Uh, over the last several years, both in a group play, so multiple uh, caregivers uh, engaging in a single session, as well as uh, individual play where uh, single caregivers are then at home playing either on their tablets or, or PCs. Uh, so in terms of the technical and content feedback, we've wondered uh, what are the challenges and if there's some potential for artificial intelligence or advanced algorithms to address some of those uh, points. So firstly, we wondered about uh, quantitative feedback. Is it really reflecting the true psychosocial reality in dementia? Um, the challenge here is that the reality is highly complex uh, with significant interdependencies. So uh, we believe that an approach to try and approach reality, uh, we could apply more advanced calculations um, such as Markov chains. And I'll describe that a little bit on the next couple of slides. Uh, we've also had some feedback that not all scenarios are recognizable for all, all users. So currently the scenarios are manually uh, authored beforehand, um, meaning that they're uh, within the module static. Um, the, the challenge here is that uh, dementia is a very heterogeneous presentation and course. Uh, so what one caregiver might have experienced, uh, it could be completely different from another caregiver. And obviously those caregivers could be uh, caring for someone at a different uh, stage, generally speaking, or, or sort of substage. 
Um, so a challenge within would be to dynamically show the most relevant content to each user to individualize and tailor it. Um, so we believe that th there's also potential there in terms of AI or advanced algorithms to tailor the modules or scenarios to the areas of impairment that are relevant for that particular user or other classifications um, that could be relevant beyond areas of impairment or within areas of impairment. So for example, if uh, one uh, user, um, one caregiver has a, a loved one who does not have any mobility impairment, uh, it doesn't really make sense to show them a scenario in which mobility impairment is the key challenge. Uh, so user choices may not be always uh, realistic and sometimes sort of a best answer in a way uh, could be identifiable. Um, so the challenge there currently is that um, choices are generated manually so they might not always reflect our true intentions, which is really having balanced options, um, sort of the gray zone that's that's reflecting a better real life, not really the pure black and white, uh, where you know it's possible that a lot of users will lean towards option one, for example, and uh, avoid option two or three. We want to have um, realistic uh, options that involve trade-offs, such that each option might have some positives or some negatives uh, to try and have a balance of, of different options. Um, there we, we think there's some potential for dynamic generation of user choices that could be more balanced than the uh, manual authoring that we've done thus far. Um, qualitative feedback is not specific to the user choices or reflecting user in person with dementia characteristics. Uh, so a challenge there is that feedback is static with limited specificity currently. So it's linked to the um, inherent impairment uh, of, of each module, but it's not linked to um, if they made, for example, a user made a certain pattern of choices, uh, the, the feedback will still be the same no matter if they made very similar choices throughout or very different choices throughout. So we think that there is some potential to apply algorithms that could provide sort of archetype or um, feedback based on certain user choice patterns or classifications of users. And then lastly, uh, what could we learn from trends in, in, by an individual user or across, uh, across users? So there's cross-user analytics, I think that could be a challenge. Um, and then related to that, how, how do we perform that? And what is really the utility um, of classifying users based on choices and, uh, and ensuring that we can collect some analytics there that might be useful? So the potential there, I think, would be to um, generate insights from a research perspective, as well as identify patterns and choices to either present that pattern to, uh, to users or to understand that pattern and then present feedback that is specific to that pattern. And ultimately, I think all of these uh, elements, uh, these components are really related to trying to improve user experience through enhanced tailoring and individualization. So what's the feasibility? I have a couple examples of how we've worked thus far on feasibility to try and understand if these might be, might be possible. So uh, this is kind of a, a simplistic overview of uh, what our current system is. So um, if, if a user chooses one option, there's uh, this scoring that's done and then we more or less, there's some other elements, but generally speaking, use a weighted average of the different determinants to come up with an aggregate score. Um, so that's what's done currently. And obviously there's some, some room for um, enhancements uh, because this might not accurately reflect the true psychosocial reality that you have, for, for example, a lot of interdependencies uh, between these elements. And that's something that um, some experts have, have uh, informed us as well. And there's been, research uh, confirming that. So our conceptual model uh, that we've come up with looks uh, generally speaking like this, uh, and I'm not a uh, AI expert or algorithmic expert, so I won't uh, go into too much detail on it, but generally speaking, the idea is that um, if user, when a user makes a choice uh, of the three different options up here, um, that choice should uh, be computed in such a way that um, psychological, emotional parameters, disease parameters, and social parameters are all uh, related and are all part of the computation. So currently, as I said, it's essentially a weighted average. Um, what we're sort of working with uh, from a conceptual standpoint is using something like a multidimensional Markov equilibrium uh, through which these um, interdependencies between uh, psychological disease and social parameters are better reflected. Ultimately, again, meaning that the uh, the tool, the IET, uh, is, is better reflecting reality than the current situation. Uh, so we've done some early work uh, together with collaborators from the University of Saskatchewan in Canada 
to uh, develop a proof of concept for, for how this could work. Um, this is generally what it looks like. Uh, we haven't gone to the level of a multi-dimensional Markov equilibrium, but we've started relatively simple initially and moved in an iterative way. Um, the biggest challenge that we've identified thus far is how to uh, marry the um, output of the computation with the uh, visual software, visual design software that we currently use uh, called Articulate 360, which is not really made to accept this um, highly complex computation and uh, uh, data generation to, to try and understand it and, and build um, scenarios subsequent to that. So what our collaborators did was they actually built a custom front end system that would integrate with the uh, engine that was being developed and it would uh, allow us to um, present certain uh, scenario storyboards that are based upon the uh, of the engine. Um, another example here is in the area of data analysis and uh, dynamic content adaptations. So for data types, we have uh, user input data, choices over time, outcome scores over time, and the number of modules played. Uh, in terms of numbers of data points, we have something like close to 400 at least per user uh, for playing with the entire uh, IET. And obviously across the population, um, you have you know quite difference or variance uh, once you start looking into different classifications like domains of impairment or a certain type of dyad relationships or genders. Uh, so we think that the potential utility here is that we could uh, evaluate relationships with input data and user choices and to gain, uh, the purpose of that would be gaining new research insights. Um, there's another option we think to classify users in terms of uh, their, their choices with respect to self-determination theory. Uh, and the idea there would be, or the purpose there would be to improve learning ultimately for the user. Um, and lastly, to generate insights into how family caregivers or classes of family caregivers really deal with challenges. Uh, and that can be both from a, a, a research insight, but ultimately to improve learning. So to uh, have it that we improve the tool and that it's uh, better reflecting the reality and to allow for a uh, more tailored uh, content for the user. So what's the feasibility uh, of these different options and the remaining challenges based on our explorative work thus far? Uh, we think that uh, scenario selection and qualitative feedback have the uh, least limitations and are therefore the, uh, uh, have the uh, highest feasibility. Um, we believe that the computation of the parameter interdependencies and the data analysis have some limitations yet uh, remain feasible from, from our work thus far. And the user choice generation has the, uh, the highest number of limitations and uh, comes with the biggest number of challenges. And I think that the uh, difficulty there is that um, we're trying to potentially uh, dynamically generate uh, user choices. And uh, the difficulty is from really a narrative coherence standpoint and to ensure that the uh, choices that are generated are really reflecting reality, that they're not deviating or coming up with something completely bizarre and strange, which would of course uh, invalidate the entire purpose of, of doing this process. Um, so I have some acknowledgements here. So I'd like to thank uh, the different collaborators and researchers we've worked with, as well as funding organizations uh, in Belgium, uh, in, in the Netherlands, in Austria, and in Canada. And uh, part of this work has been funded uh, by Flyo uh, through the AAL funded Playtime project, as well as uh, work with Canadian collaborators being funded by MyTax. So thanks a lot for listening, and I'm very happy to take any questions at this time. If you have any questions about this presentation, please use the email address in the chat box. And then we switch to the next presentation by Lukas, Maria Fellner and Silvia Rusecker. Maria Fellner is CEO and co-founder of Digit AL Live. This is a new spin-off of Yehoneum Research. And she and her team develop digital solutions for health and care. And Maria has um, many, many years of experience in the field of active and assisted living, including dementia. And Silvia is the head of the research group, active and assisted living and digital care, as well as the research and information manager at Johannem Research. So the floor is yours, Lucas.
Welcome everybody to this talk. My name is Lukas Paletta. I'm head of the Human Factors Lab at the Institute Digital at UNAM Research, Applied Research Center in Austria. And this work has been done in cooperation with Silvia Rusecker, also UNAM Research, and Maria Fellner, previously UNAM Research, but now CEO of the company uh, Digital Life GmbH in Graz, Austria. The work that I want to present is on multimodal activation for cognitive performance in dementia care on the route towards AI-enabled decision support. So research on the prevention intervention uh, in dementia has recently been focusing on a non-pharmacological intervention because pharma giants, they stepped out of dementia drug research like Pfizer in 2018. And the research is now focused on the impact of uh, the risk factors, which are, for example, lack of physical, social, or cognitive stimulation, lack of sleep, bad nutrition. And as you can see in a, a well-known already diagram by Livingston and others, uh, fetched from the well-known article Lancet, there are new risk factors like air pollution quantified, uh, early risk factors like hypertension, alcohol, obesity, and so on and so forth. The focus is now on multimodal, multi-domain intervention, uh, as it has been published by Ngando and others in 2015, uh, describing the FINGER study, which has been an integrated intervention, uh, including cognitive training, CCT, physical exercises, dietary recommendation, vascular monitoring, while uh, various unimodal intervention has not been proven to be statistically significant in its effect, but multimodal intervention, yes. So the approach that is followed in Austria is called MAS training, MAS for Morbus Alzheimer's syndrome, and has been started, initiated, and implemented, and is performed by Prof uh, Professor Stephanie Auer from the MAS Alzheimer Hilfe. Following major aspects of the research uh, of Reisberg and others from New York University. And this program uh, implemented, performed by caregivers in the home of the person still living, a person with uh, dementia still living there, is based on five columns like holistic cognitive activation, facilitation of perception, physical activity, activities of daily living, and gaming and creativity basically uh, pushing up global stimulation to activate and nurture the existing multimodal resources. And basically in Austria, it is under prescription. So how is the holistic concept uh, brought up by this multimodal intervention implemented actually in, in uh, computer technologies? Uh, the focus is basically on cognitive training. As you can see in the table to the right, uh, which has been proposed by Heusel and Schüssler from Medical University of Graz uh, about recent implementation of CCT training. They are focused basically on one domain like cognitive or uh, physical intervention, but not integrating a whole uh, spectrum of different uh, multimodal intervention opportunities. And uh, as we see on the market, Lumosity, Cognit, Cognifit, and so on, they're focusing on the cognitive stimulation. They're playful. They're also focusing on person with dementia, like Emotiva, onto dementia. Neuroracer, Sea Hero, the, the app that has been downloaded 100,000 times. And there are European projects like uh, in the AEL uh, track, Rosetta, Game Up, Carebox, and so on. And they're monitoring and estimating the status of mental processes, uh, the motivation of the user for cognitive and physical activities. Uh, but the focus on the serious game is particularly stressed in a review by McCallum and others, and uh, emphasizing that assessment games are still highly underrepresented. And there's also a recent work by Adams and others uh, stressing the importance of tele-rehabilitation, particularly now under uh, the pandemic's uh, impact uh, because people are isolated at home and there's no access of uh, caregivers face to face. So you need this kind of technology to keep up your exercises, your training, your stimulation. What we are using is the digital life app uh, for multimodal activation of cognitive performance. Uh, that can be done uh, at home. You can see there's a standard uh, tablet PC uh, in a blue coverage, which uh, makes the whole technology robust against uh, 
uh, falling to the ground or other impacts. <clears throat> there is a stick, as you can see, that is appropriate for elderly, uh, easily to use. And uh, there's a demo version of the app that you can uh, download on the Google Play Store. And it includes basically uh, components for cognitive exercises, different types, also for sensor exercises. There is a research prototype for gaze control based exercises. And uh, of course, in the context of the MRS training, there is uh, support assistance in the activities of daily living. Uh, they also uh, organize narrative cafes and uh, there's a support for health services like uh, in the context of dietary recommendations or uh, motivating for mobility. So uh, basically there's a single user, uh, as you can see to the left uh, mode, uh, people are introduced, it takes maybe one month for uh, digitally native elderly people, of course to be able to use it. And then they're very proud, they're very happy to the right. You see uh, group-based uh, gaming, and this is particularly very stimulating, very motivating. And uh, uh, it's implemented as a board game. So if people, persons step on a particular field then they have to do something together with the others, and it's basically for fun in the, in the group. There's a huge diversity of playful exercises, as you can see to the left. Uh, uh, standard games like Spot the Difference, Pairs Game, uh, Multiple Choice Quiz. Uh, to the right, you can see sensor motoric uh, in, uh, exercises, uh, lifestyle questionnaire, and the puzzle. And it's particularly important to have a playful training because serious games, they support the adherence to the training. And uh, this more, uh, since there was a recent article by Coley and others, uh, emphasizing that in the finger study, CCD training was not followed so much uh, by the uh, person with dementia, only around 24% uh, under particular uh, criteria uh, followed that, uh, while physical training was uh, accepted much more and also people with the dietary consultation. Uh, if you take the same criteria and apply it uh, to the app that I described that has been implemented in a study in a European project called Playtime, uh, comparable, you come up to uh, up to 70% of usage. And that's maybe because there's a diversity of playful training. There are 44 topics. Each topic uh, consists of up to 47 exercises. There are 16 uh, types of exercises, four grades of difficulty. Uh, you can switch between different levels of uh, difficulty. And in total, there are more than 6,000 exercises available in five languages. So English, German, Slovenian, Croatian, and, and the Dutch version. And there's also a research prototype uh, called Myra for Mobile Instrumental Review of Attention. And this is basically a gaze-based interface with a serious game. And uh, it actually uh, exhibits gaze analysis in reference to the visual content of the serious game on the display. It's implemented with a tablet camera based gaze tracker is not so precise as uh, previous uh, kind of external uh, uh, technologies that are uh, attached to the tablet or to a PC, but it's sufficiently precise to track uh, basic uh, experience reaction and interaction with the visual content. And it has been evaluated in the study with 15 participants in a 10 weeks intervention. The adherence was 40%. And uh, you see now in the following a video that shows in more detail how that really worked. Lena is living in a nursing home. She is a person diagnosed with Alzheimer, a disease without a cure. Serious games for multimodal training and brain fitness. Support to delay cognitive decline. Lena is playing the Myra game. She started to play it, with the help of an Alzheimer trainer, who was visiting her every week. But finally, she can play the game, totally on her own, and she is proud of it. Myra is a game to train executive functions, through a gaze interface. Myra is played on a tablet PC. The first step is to calibrate eye gaze, with respect to the tablet-based display by gazing at flowers and confirming by pen. A device embedded camera tracks the face for eye detection, and the estimation of gaze orientation. After calibration, the game menu appears. 
Games are inspired by activities of daily living, like feeding a cat, gardening, or cleaning. The tablet camera tracks the elderly eye movements, controlling the game by gaze only. Lena has her eyes shut quite a lot, but the gaze tracker works quite well. Alzheimer's impacts inhibitory functionality of eye movements. Prozac aids fixate the stimulus, and anti-Zac aids gaze away from the stimulus. Anti-Zac aid tests are used to estimate the mental state. Martin shows us how to calibrate, his head and eyes are tracked, one has to fixate flowers. The red dot depicts the system's estimate of gaze on display, within two areas of interest. The doors, the anti zacade test will be evaluated. A good or bad character might appear, and by fixating them, characters get activated, either for good or bad. The bad guy will steal food from poor cat's feeding dish. The good grandmother will provide food to the cat, to make her healthy and happy. Lena is activating the grandmother for feeding, and gets points for the overall score. Images at the bottom show different states of cat happiness. Activation of a good character provides food, and makes the cat even more happier. The images shows the progress of the game, and keeps users motivated to perform well. Lena receives a score of 1.5 out of 5 stars. Lena always wants more stars, the score is logged to the server for each game. Here is the horizontal amplitude of gaze over time. The appearances of good characters in blue should be gazed, bad characters marked in red should be avoided. Correct gaze behavior provides a gain of points. Myra stands for Mobile Instrumental Review of Attention. 15 participants in a field trial played it. The mean game score correlates very well, with several important dementia rating scales such as the Montreal Cognitive Assessment or MOCA, and even with activities of daily living. A second-order polynomial regression provides accurate estimates of cognitive assessments. The mean estimation error is about 2.6 points. Finally, Lena had a lot of fun playing the game. Let's now have a look on the neuropsychological profile of dementia as it has been investigated by Mesolam and also Weintraub and others in 2015. Look at their diagram to the right. At the bottom, you see neuropathological tissue diagnosis like Alzheimer's disease, which is associated with, of course, amnestic dementia, a clinical dementia profile, and in turn associated with a deficit or impact on the large-scale neuroanatomical network like the medical temporal limbic. And you can see with different types of highly related uh, dementia types like Alzheimer, the frontotemporal and the cortical levy body disease, you can see that are different kind of weighting on the impacts on different kind of clinical dementia profiles and different uh, impacts uh, highly related on the large-scale neuroanatomical network. So uh, what you can see is there's an impact on the disease on distinctive networks associated with the co cognitive domain. So with different diseases uh, related to the networks and uh, basically uh, if we look on the time domain for the early stages of dementia as they have uh, visualized it in the diagrams, look to the top to the right, in the early stage of dementia, there's more differentiation between the domains. Uh, some of them are unimpaired or mildly impaired versus others are distinctly abnormal. So uh, that means there's a kind of very specific profile, not only for the specific uh, dementia disease, but also probably uh, for the individual setting. In progress dementia, uh, the symptom domain boundaries become blurred. You see it with the uh, light bars and uh, towards a uniformly affected uh, function. And the open question or the question for investigation is whether the individual settings of the early neuropsychological profile can be extracted uh, and reflected. And the approach in the Playtime project was 
to investigate, uh, as you can see to the left, different kind of exercise types like uh, a puzzle, the box finder, math ga games, pairs games, and so on and so forth, and how they relate to uh, specific functional uh, impairments uh, or capacities related to the MOCA subscores, like the visual spatial executive or attention or abstraction capacity. And the psychological experts have uh, uh, matched these kind of uh, exercise types with uh, capabilities in different kinds of functional domains. And uh, for example, for the puzzle, they have identified the attention domain is uh, highly relevant and so on and so forth. And uh, in a small study, so as a first step in the direction of uh, finding out more about the diversity in the cognitive assessment and the, in the impairment, uh, eight participants have been investigated in a 10 weeks intervention with weekly MIS trainer visits and uh, quite high adherence to the gameplay. And uh, basically there was an overall uh, play score, the digital score that was highly correlated with the mocker, um, but also specific game scores indicated a specific neuropsychological performance, the performance of this specific uh, functional uh, capability. So for example, as you can see uh, to the left down, the difference puzzle, for example, was the score uh, of playing that was uh, highly correlated with the visual spatial executive or as you can see, the, the abstraction uh, capability was highly uh, correlated with uh, another category called outsider played and to the right orientation, highly correlated to box finder. So if you play the game, you get a score and this score is highly correlated and tells you about the, the functional impairment in the end. In this sense, there's a coverage of neuropsychological profile uh, based on the application of the Digital Life app, uh, but also the Myra app. And you can see uh, down there in the table to the left, the different kind of subscores uh, of the MOCA uh, assessment, uh, and to the right, uh, how they are covered by different kind of uh, game scores. Yeah, and we want to investigate it in more detail in a, a more or less large uh, national project called Multimodal. Uh, which is managed by my colleague Silvia Rusega and me. It's a test region in Styria. And uh, it's about, uh, originally it was thought to be one and a half years, uh, having a neuropsychological test battery uh, at the end, uh, at the beginning and, and the intermediate stages, and also uh, investigating the risk factors, the lifestyle uh, parameters over time, uh, applying the playful training in the, with the digital life app, and then doing a AI based data analysis. So under the pandemics now, originally it was thought they have 220 patients involved. So maybe we will scale down or at least for the moment to uh, 30 interventions, 30 control uh, person with dementia, Alzheimer type, and uh, basically also apply uh, functional magnetic resonance uh, investigation, uh, whether it's really Alzheimer diagnosis, pre-post analysis, how it develops. And uh, we want to investigate the, the risk factors, the modifiable risk factors, uh, as we have seen at the beginning. Uh, there's early work from Norton and others that shows, quantifies the, the impact of physical inactivity and so on. And there's other work. And as you can see here, we're applying a checklist. It's called Fantastic. And our variation is called Fantastic D for D for dementia uh, by Wilson and others brought up, uh, validated positively. And that should reflect uh, actually uh, these lifestyle factors like social isolation, physical activity or inactivity, obesity, or applying uh, good diets. Uh, if you smoke or not, and so on and so forth. So this is the kind of spectrum, the list of risk and lifestyle factors that impact the, the probability to get uh, uh, dementia or to make dementia, uh, to worsen dementia if, if it's already running. So to the right, you see uh, the different kind of uh, question categories in the fantastic and the fantastic D checklist. Uh, on uh, yeah, family, like the social uh, em, em, embodiment, so to say, the activity, the physical one, the nutrition, and so on and so forth. And here you see how it's implemented in the app. 
So you can like tick different kind of uh, uh, values of the parameters, uh, how, uh, for example, active people were physically during the last uh, weeks or the last months. Uh, then the next one is about smoking, uh, uh, how, about your how you behave, uh, kind of, uh, if you're depressed, uh, your nutrition, your sleeping quality, and so on and so forth. And uh, in the end, uh, we want to refine, of course, this kind of cognitive assessment, as we have uh, seen before, and provide a kind of estimator for continuous estimation uh, of the cognitive state, the global level, uh, like the overall MOCA score of the person with dementia, looking into the black box, and also into the functional specific cognitive impairments and also see the interaction between the variables like uh, how various lifestyle uh, parameters uh, kind of interact or uh, have an impact on different kind of uh, cognitive impairments. And in the end, uh, these kind of numbers and the, the course over time should provide insight for the person with dementia themselves, also the informal and the formal care give us the whole care stuff. And uh, we want also to apply predictive analytics uh, prediction of the MOCA, the subscore, uh, as a kind of uh, functionality to have an alert for intervention in times, an early alert uh, of a possible rapid decline, because we know uh, it can happen in, in one, two months that uh, uh, the MOCA scale goal score goes down 10 points or something like that, that can happen. And, and if you care, maybe in time, then it will decline on a much uh, larger time scale. And the future aspects are, of course, to identify uh, in detail the specific functional impairments and then also uh, apply kind of a recommender in terms of a personalization to focus the training on specific functional impairments. And that should be, in theory, much more uh, efficient than how it's done currently. And in the project, we have scores from different questionnaires as data, as ground truth data, the cognitive assessment, the MOCA, uh, care dependency scale, the geriatric uh, depression scale, uh, apathy evaluation scale, and so on. The first, the MR uh, analytic results, uh, blood analysis as well. And on the other hand, we have the scores from the digital uh, series games. Uh, from the playful training, but also for eye tracking features and uh, semantic gaze interaction from the Myra game. We have the parameters from the lifestyle checklist uh, score. And uh, of course, we want to find out correlation using nonlinear regression and applying uh, for predictive analytics, uh, long short term memory networks, decision trees, and so on, uh, statistical standard statistical ARIMA estimators, and uh, want to look into more detail. And this work with the tablet PC uh, is embedded uh, in other activities that are highly related. So for example, uh, bottom to the left, social robotics, uh, there's a work uh, applying uh, the PEPA, the social robot, to motivate the person particularly to adhere to their training. Uh, and we have seen high uh, adherence to the training in this, uh, in this kind of uh, field tests and also uh, very much accepted the social robot and a very specific uh, setup to have a companion and the coach uh, kind of function of the social robot uh, that we have developed. And also augmented reality, the social robot you can see in the third demo in the afternoon, the augmented reality cognitive training you can see in the fourth demo and uh, bottom right, you can see uh, the relation to mindfulness. Uh, Develop, so developments for interventions uh, based on mindfulness ideas. You can see that in the fifth demo and uh, all these kind of ideas and developments should be related to support a person with dementia, the, the informal and the formal caregivers for prevention and intervention. So just to wrap up, uh, we have seen that early stage dementia has diversity of cognitive disruption and this kind of one size fits all stimulation might be unlikely to be the most useful approach. Therefore, we uh, give merit to a more fine grained assessment and we want to go this route for AI enabled decision support. And uh, these kind of uh, technologies should inform which aspects of cognitive performance could be targeted through the training towards a much more personalized training uh, using these AI enabled uh, diagnostics. And uh, the thanks now go to, of course, the uh, 
uh, end user, the person with dementia, the trainers who provided a lot of input, uh, enriched uh, the projects and, and without them, uh, all the developments were not uh, possible. Uh, also many thanks to all the contributors to the different kind of uh, projects. And uh, also I would like uh, to thank the funding organization and uh, thank you for your attention. Now I'm happy to receive a uh, question. I would be uh, glad to answer that. Thank you, Lucas, for this very interesting presentation. And I have one question about, in your DEPLA training, you have included mainly the cognitive and the physical training and also assessment. And what do you like to include in the future as a next step? Yeah, well, uh, in the beginning, there was this kind of multimodal uh, concept uh, presentation like it is research now. Uh, and of course, there are many more uh, aspects that need to be uh, followed up. So for example, nutrition uh, seems to be very uh, promising and interesting um, aspect that needs to be uh, introduced as well. Um, then maybe much more going much more into the sensomotoric part, uh, this kind of approach that uh, uh, Henrik has shown before is very interesting, I think, but also to be, uh, yeah, researched also this mindfulness approach, maybe integrating that. So it's, it's, it might be very interesting to see, uh, yeah, how on the one hand this kind of performance oriented training, although it's uh, playful, how that kind of matches or, or comes together with, with mindfulness uh, training in between. Bettina has a question. Her question is, do we need studies with larger samples? Yeah, of course. <laughs> These are just the, the first steps and please don't uh, um, uh, don't uh, yeah we we know that of course so these are just first uh, tentative steps and uh, if possible then we go to larger steps so like in the multimodal uh, project that uh, so of course now pandemics uh, make some problems in this direction but we go one step after the other and uh, yeah so in this sense uh, we collect kind of uh, evidence in this direction Okay, uh, and Bettina stated that nutrition is a great topic for body and mind. And she also has the question, what is about dental health? Well, that, that's a topic uh, for the future. To me personally, I, I mean, I'm a computer scientist, so <laughs> I have to believe what the, the scientists say. And so uh, if Bettina says that is an important uh, component, then we should take it serious and uh, look into the details of that as well. Yeah. So uh, in a sense, it, I think it, it will, will be fruitful for any uh, person with dementia, the end user, to combine different aspects and, and uh, uh, kind of a, a rich uh, engagement and so on uh, in the sense social aspects maybe uh, seem to be also very important um, that's also <clears throat> kind of focused with this group training and other aspects so uh, against isolation and so on so there's a lot still to do <laughs> at the <laughs> starting point okay. and one question was this uh, mirror it's very yeah. interesting would it be also possible in the future to include it in other technologies like in VR? Yeah. Like more uh, real environment. Yeah, yeah, uh, definitely. So VR, uh, of course, uh, uh, in the afternoon, you will see a, a demo where we've applied it uh, and uh, actually received some interesting results, uh, still maybe on a more small scale of the population, but uh, already statistically significant, uh, also AR, augmented reality. Uh, now there's new technology out where you, and, and basically the eye movement feature can tell a lot about uh, different kinds of aspects, uh, cognition, uh, also uh, <clears throat> psychological aspects, mental aspects, and uh, also, of course, in a multimodal way. So I think uh, like uh, we have seen speech and, and motion and, and uh, eye movement, all these kind of things. Like we are, one can see it in a holistic way, we are multimodal, so to say, 
uh, for nature. And so maybe it goes in the, the direction to integrate all these kind of aspects. Thank you, Lucas. So now I will give the chair to you for the next presentations and demos. Thank you so much, Sandra, Sandra for your nice uh, um, chairing. Now we go to the next um, talk. I have now to um, Yeah, well, uh, let me briefly introduce, of course, uh, Jennifer Schlesinger. Uh, she's a Master of Public Health, uh, Certified Health Education Specialist. She's the Associate Vice President of Healthcare Services and Community Education at Alzheimer's Los Angeles. Uh, Ms. Schlesinger oversees multiple nationally recognized and award-winning projects, including the Dementia Call MediConnect project a project transforming healthcare in the state of California for low income older adults with dementia and Alts Direct Connect, a program which connects families dealing with dementia to Alzheimer's Los Angeles. Uh, she has spoken locally, nationally and internationally on diversity and dementia, plain language tools for dementia care and improving care management to meet the needs of families affected by dementia. So it's a great pleasure, uh, Jennifer, to have your talk here. And I think it's extremely important to, as uh, technologists and uh, people who are dealing with theory, to be grounded by the real problems, uh, the real requirements, uh, by those uh, that we are serving to. So I just will start the talk now. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to you today on dementia, diversity, and disparities. I will be sharing with you a perspective from the United States and hope that some of our experiences and our resources may be of value to you. My name is Jennifer Schlesinger, and I'm the Associate VP of Alzheimer's Los Angeles. Alzheimer's Los Angeles is a nonprofit community-based organization that has 40 years of experience working with diverse and multilingual families affected by Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. I wanna start by giving you a sense of the demographic makeup of the United States. This data is from our last census, which was conducted 10 years ago. The United States has over 328 million people living in our country. Whites make up about two thirds of the population. Hispanics or Latinos make up about 19% of the population, followed by African Americans at 13%, Asians at about 6%. American Indians and Alaska Natives make up 1% of our population and Native Hawaiians and other Pacific Islanders make up 0.2%. This is a headline from a local news source a few years ago. Latino Muslims find a home at mosque led by Cambodian refugees. If that does not epitomize the diversity in some parts of the United States, I don't know what does. As diverse as the United States is, some states and cities are far more diverse than others. I am from Los Angeles, California, which is a city filled with multiple languages, cultures, religions, experiences. Few cities are as diverse as mine. In the pre-COVID world, these were some everyday pictures of my city, rich, colorful, vibrant. The United States has always been a country of immigrants, bringing strength and tremendous diversity to us. 
13.5% of our population is foreign born. Pivoting to some grim data that impacts many families and certainly those affected by dementia as well is that one in 10 Americans live in poverty. Poverty, food security, transit, healthcare, education, everything. There is more and more discourse, especially among healthcare organizations and community based organizations, around the social determinants of health and how we must focus on the social factors that impact health as well as well being. Many social determinants of health are linked to literacy and health literacy. Less than half of Americans read at or below a sixth grade reading level and over 36 million adults in the US, that's about 10% of the country cannot read, write, or do basic math above a third grade level. Low literacy affects many aspects of a person's life and it certainly has a significant impact on health. Literacy is linked to many health outcomes. Almost half of American adults have trouble understanding and using health information. This is terribly costly to our healthcare system. Over $230 billion a year in healthcare costs are linked to low adult literacy, resulting in limited health decision-making capacity and increased health costs. The United States certainly faces many challenges requiring partnerships, innovation, and problem solving. So now let me overlay some Alzheimer's data onto the demographic data I just shared. 5.8 million people have Alzheimer's disease and pre-COVID it was the sixth leading cause of death in the United States. One in 10 people age 65 and older has Alzheimer's and this goes up to one in three for people aged 85 and older. Caring for people living with Alzheimer's or other dementias are family or unpaid caregivers in the United States, there are over 16 million unpaid caregivers. We rely very heavily on family members to care for people living with dementia. Often, they are not trained and they lack support in carrying this challenging load. Current studies show that although more non-Hispanic whites are living with Alzheimer's and other dementias, than any other racial or ethnic group in the United States. Older African Americans and Hispanics are more likely on a per capita basis than older whites to have Alzheimer's or another dementia. Studies indicate that African Americans are about twice as likely to have Alzheimer's as older whites and Hispanics are about one and a half times as likely to have Alzheimer's as older whites. However, studies are showing that there is variation among specific Latino ethnic groups. Asian Americans seem to have the lowest incidence of Alzheimer's and related dementias, even lower than whites. And this held true for all Asian American subgroups that were studied. The disparities in dementia prevalence are startling. Health conditions such as cardiovascular disease and diabetes are associated with increased risk for Alzheimer's and other dementias such as vascular dementia. Hypertension, stroke, and diabetes are more prevalent in the African American community and the Latino community. Health-related behaviors, such as seeking regular medical care, having access to care, and health literacy are more limited in the African-American and Latino communities. Socioeconomic factors, such as lower levels of education, higher rates of poverty, and greater adversity and discrimination increase risk for Alzheimer's, as well as the other conditions I just mentioned. Given the prevalence of dementia in the United States and the disparities in dementia prevalence for Alzheimer's for African-Americans and Latinos, 
I want to add yet another layer to this picture I am painting. I'm going to paint some broad strokes of the healthcare landscape in the United States as it relates to dementia. Rates of dementia are increasing in the United States, yet it is still not being well managed. Only half of people ever get a diagnosis, and of those that do, only about half of them get the diagnosis documented in their medical record. Less than half of people, about 45%, have the diagnosis disclosed to them. And in communities of color, missed diagnoses are even more common. And diagnoses that happen later in the disease process are common as well, and these lead to a slew of issues. Complicating the picture even further is that the average person with dementia has two to eight chronic coexisting conditions. And as mentioned, we know that the rates of cardiovascular disease and diabetes are higher in communities of color, thus complicating care even further. With that backdrop, let's dive into diversity and how diverse perspectives inform communities' understanding of dementia and their management of the disease. When we talk about diversity, it encompasses so many elements. While I do not have time to speak about all of these diverse groups, I will focus on a few, primarily cultural, raci racial, and linguistic diversity. But before I continue, I'd like to speak to a few overarching principles that are important to contextualizing this discussion on diversity. It's important to realize that when generalizations are made about dementia and certain groups, they are only generalizations. However, these statements can be insightful and help us understand, loosely understand, how different communities may understand dementia. We also need to realize that there can be a range of views within communities. Sometimes we think of diverse communities as all the same, but there is often a wide range of experiences, perspectives, and views within communities. We should also keep in mind that perceptions and ideas change over time. Groups change, attitudes change, practices change. Diverse communities change. Policies, politics, media, experiences all impact communities. To think that perspectives stay stagnant is a misconception. Perceptions among and within communities are fluid and will change. So why is it important to understand diverse perspectives in dementia? Because our views of illness, dementia, and aging affect whether or not we identify the disease in a timely manner and seek professional services to get a diagnosis. This then affects the entire trajectory of the disease and how, or if, post-diagnostic care and support is provided and received. I'd like to said, shed some light on how different communities in the United States view illness, dementia, and aging. Some of these views can create barriers to seeking a diagnosis, which can result in people receiving a delayed diagnosis, meaning that they are further along in the disease process when they learn that they have a dementia. Caucasians or whites have a very Western view of medicine. The Western view of medicine and healthcare is based on a biomedical model. There is value placed on the objectivity of science and scientific methods. Whites generally see dementia as a medical condition affecting the brain and causing brain dysfunction, causing cognitive impairment. Non-Western views of medicine and health look very different. It's not uncommon that there is less focus on the medical model and more focus on the mind, body, and spirit. Often there is greater emphasis on the holistic nature of illness and also wellness. 
for many ethnically diverse communities in the United States and around the world, elderly people are highly respected and honored. They are revered for their wisdom and life experiences. In fact, the aging process itself is embraced by many communities. For some communities, aging is something that is managed within the family unit, and the challenges associated with aging are not necessarily shared with outsiders. We see this in the Latino community, for example. In some culturally and linguistically diverse communities, dementia is seen as a normal part of the aging process. Changes in memory may be seen as normal, and dementia may even be called old timer's disease. Changes in memory and thinking are just things that go along with getting old, not necessarily a disease process. In some communities, such as the African American community, aging may be seen as surviving years of struggle and seen as a triumph over adversity. In some communities, aging is associated with forgetfulness and cognitive decline is expected. However, some communities, such as the Chinese community, dementia may be viewed as a mental illness once the disease progresses and symptoms worsen. And some healthcare providers share these beliefs, which complicates the picture even further. I'm often asked why so many people are not diagnosed with dementia. And like I said, in the US, only half of people ever get a diagnosis. There are many barriers to seeking a diagnosis, often resulting in delayed diagnosis and later in the disease process, especially for communities of color. The social stigma associated with dementia can cause some communities like the Latino community or Chinese American communities to delay seeking professional assistance. When the disease is seen as a mental illness associated with madness or craziness, it can lead to communities' reluctance to identify the disease in the first place. In some communities, such as the Chinese American community, the shame that is brought by the disease can be very humiliating and may even extend to the entire family unit. This stigma, shame, and humiliation can impede disease identification and diagnosis. It can also lead to resistance in disclosing a diagnosis, if in fact one is obtained. For some families who have obtained a diagnosis, the diagnosis itself may have tremendous shame associated with it. The diagnosis may be seen as shaming the family for doing something wrong, for causing the disease. And this in turn can be a poor reflection on the family and the family lineage. In many ethnically diverse communities, upholding the image of the family is very important. All of these factors can lead to a sense of shame, a silence, silent sense of shame. We see that some communities do not want to talk about the disease because it is so shameful to the person with the disease as well as the family. And this can lead to a culture of non-disclosure. We know that silence breeds more silence and makes this disease even more taboo. Consider this case study of Omar who's Pakistani. He's showing early signs of dementia his family speaks English and Urdu. Dementia is directly translated into Urdu as insanity or of unsound mind. Think about how this might affect Omar's family and feelings of shame, feelings of stigma. Or consider the Chinese characters used to represent dementia. They are the symbols for crazy, stupid, there are certainly negative connotations associated with the disease and the person who has it. And this gets magnified by the great value placed on intellect in many Asian communities. Labeling someone with dementia may feel to some people that they are calling their parent or loved one crazy or stupid or mentally weak. And this is disrespectful. 
some cultures believe that even talking about a disease will make it happen, that you can speak a disease into existence. This too results in silence so that the disease is pushed under the table and not discussed. All of these factors have the potential to result in withdrawing from community to avoid shame or embarrassing the family, which can lead to lack of social connectedness, to social isolation. If a family is embarrassed by their loved one's cognitive impairment, they may stop going to social events or community gatherings or to church. This can lead to families not acknowledging the disease or seeking services or feeling that services are not even needed in the first place. Families may have internal pressure to deal with the problems in an insular manner rather than seeking outside assistance or support. The feelings of shame in admitting the need for help can be a tremendous barrier. There are also some additional barriers to seeking healthcare services that I want to take a few moments to discuss. Among many ethnically, racially, and linguistically diverse communities in the US, people may be unaware of available services, or if they are aware of the services, they may not know how to even gain access to them. There are also other barriers to accessing formal healthcare services, which can impact disease identification and diagnosis. Some communities have histories going back decades of distrust of the medical community because of inhumane treatment, including unethical medical practices. And institutionalized racism is not a thing of the past in the United States, and it permeates all aspects of our society. Our healthcare system lacks bicultural and multicultural healthcare providers to meet the diverse needs of our communities. This creates a barrier to accessing care that is based on relationship building and mutual trust and understanding. There are also linguistic barriers that can impede receiving a diagnosis. If families are unable to access care because providers are not bilingual or materials about dementia are not available, in multiple languages, then there is less likelihood of a diagnosis being sought. There is often limited information about dementia and the diagnostic process that is available at lower literacy levels and in multiple languages. In my city, in Los Angeles alone, there are over 220 spoken languages. This dearth of information makes it difficult for linguistically diverse communities to access information. Post-diagnostic care for a person living with dementia rests heavily on caregivers. In the United States, ethnic minority caregivers provide more care than white caregivers. As the disease progresses, caregiving responsibilities become more robust. Yet different communities approach caregiving in different ways. There are certainly diverse perspectives on caregiving, which are important for us to understand so that post-diagnostic care is most effective. To discuss caregiving, I want to acknowledge that the word caregiver alone is a challenge in many communities of color. Many people do not identify with the word caregiver as they see themselves as a spouse, a child, a sibling, providing care to someone. In Spanish, the word caregiver doesn't even exist. Let me frame this another way. When I became a parent, I never called myself a caregiver to my children. I called myself a mother. Though I provide nonstop care to my children, the label caregiver, it's awkward and it's uncomfortable. This is parallel to the experience of caregivers in many diverse communities. Trying to offer caregiver education and support is a non-starter if a person does not even identify with the term caregiver in the first place. The role of a caregiver, though, can be seen through many different cultural lenses. 
In some communities, such as the Latino community, caregiving is a family responsibility and is shared by the different members of the family, especially adult children. There may be filial roles and responsibilities that certain family members are expected to uphold. For example, in the Latino community, it may be the daughter that has the responsibility to care for her parents. Or in some Asian communities, it may be the wife who cares for her in-laws. Some communities see caregiving as a normal expectation, a modeled behavior that is simply part of the community and the family fabric. This is different than in the white community where caregiving is not necessarily something expected or even easily accepted. Though caregiving may be expected in the Hispanic and Asian American communities, there are higher rates of depression. And among Asian American caregivers, there is less utilization of professional supportive services as compared to whites. This could be due to resistance to seek support, could be due to language barriers. In some communities, caregiving is an inherited responsibility that is passed down to daughters or daughter-in-laws, for example. It may be seen as an honor to care for a loved one. It may also be seen as a duty. One caregiver said to me, it is a heavy duty done with immense love. In the African American community, there may be a tendency to receive help from a non-family member. And in the African American community, they may be more likely to define family in broad and flexible ways where fictive kin play a significant role in caregiving. For example, it may be a neighbor that provides care and is seen as a daughter, even if there are no actual bloodlines. All of these factors discussed potentially result in caregivers not asking for help and therefore not planning ahead. This can eventually lead to tremendous caregiver stress, depression, fatigue, and burnout. By the time many caregivers in communities of color reach out for help, assistance, or support, they have already hit a brick wall. Situations that could have been avoided are now crises. So how do we forge ahead most effectively? First, we look at community assets. Ethnically, culturally, and linguistically diverse communities have tremendous assets that should be identified and leveraged. When communities think holistically and focus on wellness and not just the absence of disease, there may be an opportunity to tap into psychosocial and emotional needs. This is particularly useful when dealing with Alzheimer's and other dementias because we currently do not have many biomedical interventions. What we have are services and programs that focus on psychosocial and educational aspects of the disease and caregiving. Also, many communities use complementary therapies and approaches. While there is currently not a lot of high quality research on these therapies, there may be benefits from things like aromatherapy, music therapy, art programs, perhaps even certain dietary supplements. Though of course it's important to note that when people use complementary therapies, they really need to discuss these with their trained medical professional to ensure that they are safe and do no harm. In culturally diverse communities, elders are often respected and honored, and aging is celebrated and is not something that is taboo. These are worldviews that can be useful to leverage when working with families affected by a disease that is most prevalent among the elderly. Furthermore, it is an asset that in many communities caregiving is not seen as a disruption, but rather something that is normal, a way of life, something that is observed, learned, and repeated over time. 
And sometimes it's even embraced. This can be an amazing gift. Many families have the desire to care for their loved one at home rather than putting them in a nursing home. When family and even extended relatives are such central components of people's lives, there are more social networks and supports to draw from. This helps keep people living with Alzheimer's disease and other dementias engaged and living in the community. Many communities of color have social support systems embedded into their fabric. This may be within the neighborhood setting, with community centers, or faith-based organizations. For some people, there is great value placed on spirituality, faith, and prayer. This can be helpful to people dealing with Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. It can help support families as they deal with the disease. In the African-American community, coping strategies that include relying on prayer, faith, religion, extended family, friends, and clergy appear to decrease the effects of the burden of caregiving. Also, many diverse communities are significantly influenced by the larger community and their peers' norms. This can affect attitudes and practices. For example, if someone in the community discloses their diagnosis, this can make others feel that it is more acceptable to talk about it as well. Or if someone had a positive interaction with a health care provider, others in the community may be interested in seeking medical care from that same provider. So given all that I've shared, let's end with some strategies that can be employed to more effectively work with diverse communities. We need to understand that the family's culture impacts their choices, both current and future choices, whether it is about caregiving, respite, nursing home placement, or end-of-life care. We should always consider the family's background, beliefs, and experiences. And though sometimes they may be formed from our own, we need to check our bias and opinions at the door and be open to listening and learning. Professionals need to cultivate relationships. I realize that this takes time. It is not something that can be easily achieved in a conversation or two. And it is even more challenging when we are from distinctively different cultural backgrounds. We should be providing services in the native language or the language of preference to families. We should also be sensitive to linguistic nuance. There are opportunities to collaborate with the natural and informal networks within communities. These may be churches, restaurants, shops, salons, barber shops. If there are places where people congregate and socialize, these are good places to tap into. And we should be using collaborative approaches to person and family centered care planning. Care plans are not about us as professionals telling families what to do or how to do, they are about understanding the needs and collaboratively setting priorities, goals, and interventions. Person and family-centered care hinges on understanding the culture, beliefs, preferences, language, and unique needs of families. Each family is different, and their care needs are influenced by their cultural and linguistic norms and beliefs. Increasing targeted outreach to diverse communities through tailored disease awareness and education helps overcome misconceptions and stigma about the disease. It normalizes the disease process and disease experience. Outreach needs to be conducted in a targeted way that is appropriate for the specific community being reached. If the word caregiver does not resonate in a community, 
An alternative word may need to be used for a caregiver or educational class. If the word Alzheimer's is off-putting, perhaps talking about memory loss may be more effective to kickstart a conversation. If education is being provided to multi-generational immigrant families, education and materials may need to be available in English and another language. One family with whom I was speaking shared with me that their grandmother was monolingual Japanese speaking, but the granddaughter, who could speak Japanese, was unable to read in Japanese. If the granddaughter and grandmother were looking at information together, it was important for the fact sheet to be double-sided with Japanese on one side and English on the other side. Consideration needs to be placed on evaluating materials for cultural and linguistic appropriateness, as well as literacy levels. Careful thought should be given to design and images that are used. We should ask ourselves if the images on materials reflect the communities we are trying to reach. We need to ensure that we have materials in various languages that are not simply translated, but were transformed to be linguistically and culturally relevant. And of course, professionals need training on diversity and the unique needs of different communities. Ideally, your dementia care workforce should reflect both culturally and linguistically the communities they serve. Materials need to be at an appropriate literacy level for the communities we are reaching. When materials and education classes are offered at too high a literacy level, information is not understood and it's not useful. A plain language approach benefits caregivers because it makes information easier to understand, more accessible, and hopefully actionable. Most people benefit from quick and clear information. Caregivers do not have the luxury of time to read pages and pages and pages of dense text. Caregivers need to understand information that is applicable and actionable. Having plain language materials and educational resources allows families to care for a loved one by increasing their awareness of the disease and building skills. Plain language increases access, access to information, and access to education and support that can build self-efficacy. And if you think about it, plain language benefits everyone. It certainly benefits people with lower literacy levels, people who have less formal education. It would help a person whose second language is English, and they have a harder time reading things in English. It benefits older people as well, as people age, their attention span can become more limited, therefore making it harder to absorb dense information. Caregivers also benefit from plain language since they are often overwhelmed with information, yet so desperately need additional knowledge and skills. Here is an example of an informational fact sheet on bathing and dementia transformed into plain language. You can see there's less text, simple tips, actionable items, more white space, and even a graphic. Alzheimer's Los Angeles has caregiver tip sheets on various dementia-related topics. They are all written in plain language at a lower literacy level and are available in multiple languages. And you can download these tip sheets for free on our website. And I put the, our website address up here for you to see. We've also developed an educational resource called Lost Memories or Recuerdos Perdidos. This is a telenovela that was developed in both English and Spanish to meet the needs in the Latino community. Knowing that Latinos watch more television, that novelas are popular, that Latinos are more likely to act on information they see, and that Latinos are more likely to seek health information from television, 
This four-part novella was developed as a culturally competent educational tool to address health disparities in the Latino community as they relate to Alzheimer's disease, to engage communities in a conversation about Alzheimer's in a non-threatening manner, and to help overcome stigma. The novella, all four episodes can also be accessed on the Alzheimer's Los Angeles website. As mentioned, when developing informational materials about Alzheimer's disease, images should reflect the community and information should be provided in the language of the community. In this case, this flyer is available, as you can see, in both English as well as Korean. Another educational series that was developed with a cultural lens is the Faces of Caregiving series. While previous caregiver videos and awareness raising videos on Alzheimer's focused on Caucasian families, this series specifically showcases the personal stories of five unique Japanese and Japanese American caregivers. Four of the videos are in English with Japanese subtitles, and one video is in Japanese with English subtitles. They all feature lay people, so they are easy to understand. They are not complex or filled with jargon. They are simple and relatable. In summary, we believe that it's important to recognize the ways in which plain language intersects with culture and language, and that this intersectionality is at the forefront when creating or transforming materials and programs that are more widely accessible. We know that we can reach more caregivers and do so more effectively and efficiently when we use plain language. We also know that materials and programs that are in plain language will help everyone. I hope that you'll consider available plain language programs and materials, as well as culturally and linguistically appropriate materials, and see how they may be useful in your community. Our website, alzheimersla.org, is one place you can find plain language materials. And here is the bottom line. We need to understand and respect and value the values, beliefs, and needs of diverse communities, recognizing and embracing the fact that all communities have assets. So we should be leveraging those assets and taking a strength-based approach we need to tailor and transform services and programs to meet specific needs of specific communities. And we need to create services and programs that meet specific cultural and linguistic needs. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to you today. I hope that you've gained some insight into the diverse communities in the United States and how organizations like Alzheimer's Los Angeles are working to meet cultural and linguistic needs so that families affected by dementia are better supported on their journey. Yeah, thank you so much, Jennifer, for this extremely outstanding talk uh, on diversity, different cultural viewpoints, and different viewpoints are always enriching uh, the overall, overall view on, on something. Uh, we are coming now to the afternoon session uh, for the demonstrations, the demo videos. And uh, I can just briefly introduce, we'll have first a video on the playful multimodal activation with the digital life app you have seen before already the app in the context of different uh, projects. And now Maria Fellner uh, will herself introduce uh, from the company side, the app, then we will have a view on CRS. You have seen the uh, talk given by Connor Buffer before, and here uh, we'll have a demonstration of the working of that. Then there will be a demonstration about the social robot Amigo, a national project in Austria, and, and the specific uh, concept. 
then about uh, augmented reality assistance and finally last but not least uh, virtual reality oriented mindfulness training um, yeah that will be now ahead of us and i will just switch to the first presentation uh, in a second of the second Krems Dementia Conference. I am Maria Fellner and I am CEO and co-founder of Digital Life GmbH. I have the pleasure to present demo number one in this workshop, which is about playful multimodal activation with the Digital Life app. You may have heard already from the scientific point of view from my colleagues from UNM Research. So, now I will focus on the practical aspects of this app. The app itself is based on the multimodal training model of MIS Alzheimer Hilfe Austria. The app for tablets was developed in cooperation with Johannium Research Institute Digital and the Sozialverein Deutschlandsberg. It can be used for activating training either at home, for staying active independently or with relatives. It can also be used by experts or trained volunteers who visit people at home and do activating training every week with these elderly people at home. Or it can also be used in stationary settings for groups, for example, in health and care centers, um, either for individuals or in group settings. The principle is that you have daily training with supervision every week, for example, and in between you can do the training also independently. On our website, you can uh, watch a video where the method of the Digital Life app is explained. Each training unit has a specific theme, for example, water. And this theme contains a fixed sequence of exercises that stimulate the different senses of the human being, such as movement, cognition, perception, activities of daily life, and creativity. Each training starts with movement and perception exercises for warm-up, and then these exercises are followed by knowledge questions, calculations, close words, texts, puzzles, image pairs, troubleshooting images, audio puzzles, and more. It is important that users and caregivers get coaching and training before start working and training with the app. You can see here a touch training with our trainer Elke and we also use touch pens if it does not work quite well with the fingers alone and uh, you can also use helpful tools if holding a touch pen is not too easy for the elderly person. The goal of this training is that elderly people are able to use these technologies under guidance or even independently. And we can tell you from our practice, it really works, even from uh, people of an age of 80 years. 
Here are some examples of the exercises from the theme water in German. So it starts with the movement exercises. You can play the video. There is also an explanation whether it is sitting or standing to be exercised. Then you can play the video and watch the uh, watch uh, and hear the explanation of the video and do it like the trainer does in the video. In the bottom, you can see a quiz about uh, about water, and when you then touch on the answer you have chosen, then you get a feedback whether your answer is right or not, and you even get a picture with the right answer. Then there are, for example, puzzles, puzzles or texts where some letters are missing and you have to put it in. There are math exercises and um, also exercises, references, activities of daily living. For example, what do you do one after the other when when uh, doing uh, some, some daily activities. Then there are uh, picture pairs and spot the difference exercises, for example, or uh, questions, which of these four uh, words, uh, which of these four words does not fit to the other three? and of course also with the right answer. It is important that you can choose the tempo of the exercises by yourself. So when having done one exercise, you touch on the arrow and then go to the next exercise. If you want to make a break, this is possible. And it's also uh, very welcome that the trainer um, gets in dialogue with the person who does the training, for example, about the pictures which are shown. There are also um, noise examples where you have to guess which noise this is and also songs to sing together with a choir. At the end, you can get a feedback how many exercises have been right and uh, correctly solved and uh, how many time you have uh, needed for solving and doing all these exercises. The training content of the tablet app is also offered in form of a dice game and can thus be used for group trainings. There are the same exercises in, but they are uh, ordered in another layout. So you can use the tablet together with the dice game and do activating training, for example, for groups in a nursing home. The advantages of the training app are as followed, follows. You can use it individually or in group sessions. You can use it at home or in health, care and social organizations. There are many different topics and each topic is available in four levels of difficulty. And there, uh, when you have an ABO um, of the software, you get new content every month. The content is thoroughly tested in practice and it is professionally well-founded and clearly structured. So you can use uh, this content and these training units immediately without any additional effort. And so this app raises interest and motivation to integrate this multimodal training regularly into everyday life. One, one slide uh, about the innovation from an organizational point of view. 
The first step was the service innovation offered by these mobile activating trainings. For example, by MIS trainers or volunteers or others. Since dementia is a huge societal challenge, it is in the strategic focus of many organizations in health and care. But for offering such trainings, skilled personnel and tools are necessary for offering this service. And um, so this um, they, the new offer is this activating multimodal training in a mobile or stationary setting. From the technology point of view, digitalization and data analysis is the second step. We have with this app, we have done the digitalization of this activating multimodal training as a serious game. So it is now a tablet app with content. In our research projects, as the previous lecture has shown from your name research, eye tracking data are used as biomarkers during solving tasks and the derivation of dementia indicators. But this is not yet in the app now. This is for future versions and uh, for the certificate and needs a certification as a medical product. And uh, this status monitoring and future decision support is based on the, on the performance data of the app. And so this can be used as a medical device in future for therapy and diagnostics. From a process point of view, the innovation is changing workflow and division of labor. The creation of content for the training is done in the content management system, system by skilled professionals. And this preparation of dementia trainings is now based on a division of labor. Because skilled persons, educated professionals prepare the content, but then, um, for example, volunteers can take the app and do such activating trainings without a two years education. Even a personalization of the content due to the special interests of the person is possible in the backend. And another effect is that digital documentation of the training content, the client data and status monitoring is also easily done. So if you're now interested in testing this app, you can go to our website and get your free test version. You can then download this on your Android tablet from the Google Play Store. You'll find the link on our website, www.digitallife.test. And you can also get in contact with us for a pilot project also in your organization. Please feel free to contact me. I'm happy to exchange experiences with you. Thank you. So thanks a lot, Maria, uh, for your presentation. And uh, the question is, is if there are any questions on the way. Uh, people have been attentive all the way. Uh, I've seen <laughs> the number was constant, so to say. Uh, perfect. Uh, but you have motivated already that people can directly uh, go to your uh, page and so on and so forth, and uh, then also contact you directly. And by the way, all the videos will be available um, online uh, sometime after our workshop. And uh, then you can see all the information in, in detail and so on and so forth. Yeah. 
So uh, maybe a short question, Maria. So the the next step then, in which direction are you interested? Uh, uh, and uh, you have already substantiated, so you have already distributed yeah. in Austria. So, yeah. uh, so uh, it work. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, we have now a lot of content in German. Of course, we want to expand that to other cultural contexts. And also diversity is a very important topic for us, uh, as mentioned in the previous lecture, that was, was very interesting. And we are, uh, besides the topic with the medical product, we are also uh, seeking for network partners in other countries who would like to cooperate with us and transfer content into other cultural contexts because you cannot just, cannot just translate the content because there are idioms, proverbs used in Austria, which um, are, cannot just be translated or herbs. Um, and so we need local regional network partners for uh, transferring the content and also for trainings uh, in, in this country, for example. So if you're interested in that, to work with us together, you can... Uh, content me too, of course. Fine, great. I have one question. Uh -huh. Please. So Maria, how the recommendation system of the tablet training is working? Can you shortly explain it? Well, at, at the moment, um, um, there are different topics, for example, water or autumn or Christmas. Um, and each uh, topic is in four different levels of difficulty. So you start with the easiest one. And um, if you can do that very well, you can go on to the next level. And these are then different questions. So one, one topic has in reality four different training units. Uh, and it's most important that you have fun with doing the training and um, especially if you do it with a person with dementia, not to force anything, but to, uh, uh, to motivate and uh, have fun and a good time together uh, with uh, this app. And um, in, in later versions, of course, we plan to do that more adaptive, but at the moment you can change the level on your own or the training person who does that with you will adjust the right level according to your um, to your daily status. That, I think that's very important that there are different levels for different stages of dementia. So I think that's really great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you uh, again, Maria. So uh, we come now to the next uh, video uh, about the CRA system. And uh, for this uh, purpose, actually, um, since Connor Buffett cannot join, uh, Michelle Louis-Bart from MindBytes uh, will present the video. Yeah, Michelle, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Great, Hi. perfect. So I will just, uh, in a second, uh, let me just uh, switch, prepare the next video. One moment. So I will start it, Michelle. Uh, if you talk now, we can hear you, yes? Yes, okay. Can okay. I um, uh, pause the video or not? Sorry, can excuse me? Can I pause the video myself? Um, oh, at I the moment, I will just run it if it's okay. Or you tell me to stop it or something like that. Okay, okay, perfect, thank you. Okay. Uh, I run it, okay? Yes, perfect. Uh, well, hello, I am uh, Michelle from MindBytes and I'm a colleague from uh, Connor. Uh, we develop serious games and e-learnings uh, aiming to change behaviors. 
Uh, and this game aims to improve the lives of people with dementia and their caregivers, allowing them to get to know and explore different situations they may encounter in day-to-day -day life. Uh, the game starts with a brief explanation. Perhaps you should pause it a bit here, if that's possible. Should I stop? Uh, yes, please. Uh, <laughs> maybe it was also, <laughs> there were some, you know, maybe we started again, I don't know, because there were some, or the, I stop it here. Yes, okay. That's, you can pause it here. Uh, I will explain what we just saw as well. Um, uh, so what you just saw was a brief explanation of the different choices that players uh, will need to make in the game and the outcomes that affect their choices. And you will still see that uh, once we go through the, the game itself then. Um, and after this, uh, patients uh, or players can then choose uh, which scenario they want to play. Uh, in this demo, you see a caregiver uh, experiencing Sing issues with going shopping with their loved one with dementia. Um, the caregiver comes home after a day with friends and would like to immediately go shopping, though their loved one did not remember their agreement to go shopping and is not yet ready. Um, you can play it again now, please. Thank you. Um, so she fumbles a bit to get dressed and the caregiver has to uh, choose how he wishes to react in this situation. Um, so here you see the choice screen where the uh, caregiver can choose how he would react in this situation that he just encountered. And can you please pause it here? Could you please pause the video here? Thank you. Um, so um, by making this choice, he gets a, a specific uh, feedback and scoring adapted to what he chose. Uh, this way he can know how his behavior affects his loved one with dementia, uh, his own quality of life uh, as a caregiver and um, the, both of their relationships with other people. Uh, which you see at the top of the screen here. Um, this info and tips he can then implement in his own life in future decisions uh, he has to make. So he can practice these decisions in a safe environment uh, in the digital world and then apply what he learned in the real world. Um, you can restart the video, please. Thank you. Uh, so he then goes on to uh, explore some more hurdle, hurdles uh, and each time he chooses how he wishes to cope with them. Um, with all this info at hand, he sees at the end of each scenario, um, I'll wait a bit until we're at the end. So you see an overview of how uh, good or bad you scored for each uh, part. Um, so you can see if you consistently scored good or bad for one specific part. And uh, this can give him a better insight in his own choices and help him tackle future problems that might occur. Um, after this, um, the caregiver still gets some additional practical tips. Uh, you can play again. Yep, thank you. Um, so. Here you see some, some final uh, practical tips at the end of each uh, scenario. Um, and the game can be played uh, both individually as well as in group. And from previous studies, we know that playing it in group uh, brings up a very interesting and active discussion on how to cope with the scenarios from the game. Um, lastly, I can conclude that the game was uh, developed as part of the Active and Assisted Living Program, a funded playtime project, together with UNEM Research, uh, and with continuous stakeholder feedback from healthcare practitioners in the field of dementia, and people with dementia and their caregivers themselves, we try to get the tool to its highest potential. Um, 
and please feel free to contact us if you are interested in uh, using this game. Uh, and I think that was it for the presentation of Serious Dementia. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Michelle. <clears throat> uh, very, I think, very interesting uh, serious game because it's particularly something special dealing with the psychosocial aspects and so on, which are normally not really treated in that way. And uh, yeah, it was a pleasure to cooperate with Mindbytes, with the company in the European project Playtime. We had this kind of suit of different kind of games. And uh, that was, so to say, covering the psycho uh, psychosocial part. And in a sense, that's also a cooperation together with the app that we have seen before in, in this kind of complete package, so to say. Yeah? Yes. Fine. OK. Um, I see there are uh, currently no questions uh, in this direction. Then we can maybe go on to the next uh, presentation, which is about the social uh, robot uh, Amigo. Uh, just give me a short second. I want to prepare it. Well, uh, the, the demo is actually in German. Uh, I'm sorry, but I will comment on it and uh, so that you can uh, understand it in a way. The sound will be low volume. <laughs> so what you can see here is uh, the robot in our human factors lab. Uh, of course, normally it was operating in a Project Amigo at the uh, households. Um, you see here also the roll-up from the project Amigo that was uh, in cooperation with the Medical University Graz, uh, Dr. Sandra Schüssler, who uh, developed the study plan and also uh, cared for everything from the psychological side, from the care side. Uh, and uh, we cooperated also with Sozialverein Deutschlandsberg, who was offering uh, their service, this MIA service, uh, in the household so that the, the robot was... Uh, transported to the households. And uh, in the Project Amigo, we had a three-week uh, intervention or a presence of the robot at each of the households, 16 households, uh, with the robot, 16 other households, uh, so to say, only with the tablet. What you can see here is that the robot and the tablet are a kind of system altogether. Uh, to the right, my colleague Martin, Martin uh, unfortunately has to represent the, the person with dementia. So uh, a person is uh, like uh, playing the digital life app uh, or a version of it, a pre-version of it uh, that you have seen before presented by Maria. And uh, well, he's asking now something uh, and the robot is reacting. So you can see uh, these are in part some kind of standard uh, uh, behaviors that, that the robot has. Uh, in general, you can see that just from the, from the soft banks, from, from the production, has some behaviors that are like uh, with many social cues, like uh, uh, moving around uh, the behavior of the arms, of the body, uh, the eyes. There's also a tension mode, so the robot can uh, identify or recognize a detective phase around and has different kind of distance zone so can react in different ways to the person that is around and basically yeah can respond to different triggers that you can uh, program and what we have done in the project is to care for triggers that are interesting for person with dementia what you see here is a kind of 
in, in terms of the package of the companion that provides entertaining and so on, a kind of photo collection with uh, pictures from the person that was personalized for each of the households. And there's also a comment uh, to each uh, picture like, do you remember that was a nice time together and this and that to uh, kind of trigger, of course, uh, memory and, and, and uh, nurture these kind of issues. Yeah, what you can see now is uh, the, the coach mode, that means, uh, so there was the companion, the entertainment, now the coach mode is uh, that uh, Pepper, uh, so to say the robot is proposing different kind of topics. Uh, usually it's starting with, uh, with a kind of uh, sensory motor coordination part, we are, we are stepping over that, is a multiple choice uh, quiz, so to say. But what is important is that the robot is always reacting uh, to the person. So if it's done well, then like here, hooray, hooray, you're great. And uh, in very different ways, reacting also with the behavior. If it's going not so well, then the robot uh, is kind of caring, like uh, doesn't matter and so on. And this, that kind of feedback was uh, very much uh, appreciated uh, by the person, actually. Uh, Sandra Schüssel is now outlining uh, uh, a whole, uh, so to say, preparing an article about that. They were very positive. <laughs> Thank you, Sandra, that you're joining. Uh, results. Let me just briefly. Uh, um, ah, yeah. and this is the video about uh, basically the, the field test, the field trial, and that is one of the, so to say, test person who was very positive among many of them, reacting and see here that yeah. uh, that she was uh, using the, the, the robot every day, actually. She was very enthusiastic about it and uh, was even indeed uh, treating the, the robot like uh, like a pet at home and was like uh, saying goodbye at the end to the robot. So it was nurturing. So that is her own pet. And then she says it's like, like her dog, Harry. Uh, and that is her neighbor who uh, is uh, confirming that uh, she likes very much the, the robot and uh, interacting with it, of course, sometimes getting tired, uh, but she always uh, goes for a new time and so on and activating the person a lot. So one has to imagine that usually a person with dementia, they are in a very passive uh, status and uh, here they are like uh, activated uh, in different ways to communicate, to express themselves. Uh, this is my colleague Gerhard Lodon, who was uh, uh, actually programming a part of the implementation uh, because what we have implemented was uh, <coughs> interpretation of the robot camera. Every test person was instructed that uh, there can be for a very short time a kind of uh, capturing of, of the motion of the person when they are doing this kind of sensory motor. Uh, um, exercise uh, in order to interpret what is the, the engagement, the, the attention. And uh, yeah, of course, it's important to interpret the, the emotion. Uh, emotion is very uh, important uh, and this uh, positive uh, emotion are uh, supported, but uh, of course, one has to be careful about that uh, because if people then miss too so much uh, when the game is. Uh, leaving the household, uh, so one has to care for this. And uh, this project was basically to set up a first system and to investigate uh, the whole uh, <coughs> yeah, uh, feasibility, uh, if it's positively received. And uh, I just go on with the video. Maybe somebody would be great after the, the, <laughs> the whole video that uh, it would be very enriching to hear if you tell them something about this uh, field test and the evaluation. So, uh, yeah, you can see here the robot is reacting all the time and in a sense it's kind of integrated quite well in the context. I think that is reflected in the qualitative setup. You can see here uh, the overall setup uh, in Violet uh, that the coach mode is motivating for the training. Then there was a calendar to memorize, uh, remember important events as an emergency service. Uh, if uh, 
someone is needing help to connect to the outside world, so to say, entertainment information service. And uh, of course, we were kind of uh, aiming at analyzing the mental, the, the engagement uh, state of the person. Yeah, in this sense, I think it's a unique uh, approach because uh, the robot is uh, uh, enhancing the adherence or supporting that the, the training is uh, really followed up. And you have seen in the previous uh, presentation that adherence uh, for this cognitive or the computer training that, that can be uh, quite a problem. And uh, this is one of our, uh, let's say, solution or uh, concepts that we follow up. Uh, to uh, enhance the motivation, to activate the person. And uh, of course, we have seen that here everything, as Sandra has also uh, outlined before, uh, like singing, to be active, to be uh, kind of engaged, uh, that, that is important point. Yeah, so I just wait for some <laughs> seconds of German to go by. Uh, this is about the start. Maybe Sandra, you, you can tell something about the study in general, uh, if you like. I don't want to. <laughs> yes, no problem. <laughs> so we had a mixed method study with Pepper. And it started in, it was March 2019, because we had a little bit of waiting time. And yes, it was a mixed method study, including an RCT study with interviews. So we had both interviews and quantitative data. And we included, we had an intervention and a control group. And in the intervention group, we had the people with dementia 16 who used the robot, including the tablet training. And in the control group, the people only use the tablet training. And we compared these both groups. And the duration was three weeks for every household. Do we have a next slide on this? Yeah, so the whole thing is going on. In the rüstet, so we dare einsetzt. The qualitative yes, and we are very happy that we found significant results with Pepper. So this is really very good. And we found that the robot increased significantly the quality of life. And in the subgroup, it was about the feelings. And if we compare these quantitative results with the qualitative results, then it is based on the communication with the robot. So the people love to communicate with Pepper. And we had also one person who said, oh my God, I love this robot and he is my friend. So it was very emotional for most of the people. And he was a family member in the, in the household and he was a good friend for them. And I think this is a really good and very important result also for the, for the next interventions and studies, because I think in this, in communication, in social contacts, the, the PEPA can help. And here we need more studies to help PEPA to be more, yes, that he can more communicate in a very natural speaking. I think this is important. Thank you. So maybe uh, we go a little bit uh, further. Uh, yeah, maybe I want to report here. Uh, that's about the video analysis. And basically, the person who started this kind of physical exercise, they tried to move along with the video that was presented to them. And we applied the um, image analysis to see how uh, the body uh, was kind of uh, configured if they were active uh, or passive in this sense. And uh, we uh, gave this kind of, we brought this kind of videos to person to qualify whether person were engaged, attent attentive and so on. And uh, this kind of subjective uh, interpretation was highly uh, correlated with uh, the interpretation of an uh, index that we actually, an uh, indicator that we uh, found out that we extracted from the videos.
Yeah, in this sense, uh, I think uh, this is more or less the, the end of the video. Um, yeah, of course, uh, the project has been finalized uh, and uh, yeah, we are looking forward to make a next step. There are very interesting new uh, opportunities to extend this system and of course uh, with a larger, large scale study. And uh, one of the important issues is, of course, to, to kind of care for the emotions uh, and also have it more entertaining in a sense uh, that uh, persons are more activated and uh, would like to give the last word to, to Sandra. What, what is your <laughs> intuition? Uh, what would be the most important next step in this direction? So I think it would be also very interesting that Pepper is combined. It's more combined with the Depla training because they're also they're extremely motivated to use the tablet training, but it should be more integrated with the robot so that the robot is more, yes, helping with the tablet training so that he, he show all exercises in a more active, um, more active and motivated way and in a playful way because this was a very big topic today. <laughs> <laughs> And he can do a lot because he can also maybe in, to help to educate caregivers, but also relatives and the person itself. So there are many opportunities for the future. And one next step also could be that he help with, it, with nutrition, for example, combined with the public training. Perfect uh, final word, so to say. Thank you, Sandra. Uh, and uh, in the next uh, video, uh, I've seen there's one question, maybe. Oh, no. Uh -huh. No. Uh, it was just a comment. Uh, we will now switch to the next video. Um, I will just have an intermediate uh, look for you. Let me just. Wir kommen nun zur nächsten. So what you uh, see now is a demonstration about augmented reality. Augmented reality, yeah, this is something between the real reality and, uh, so to say, the virtual reality, the completely artificial reality that we see with headsets. And uh, basically, this reality, the, how we see it, and something uh, put in uh, between, uh, like uh, augmentation, uh, extended stuff, uh, displaying uh, kind of uh, visualizations in the environment. And of course, it should be in tune with uh, what we see. So, for example, like uh, you see uh, below this kind of uh, environment, and the table is displayed in it, that should be a appropriate in place. So uh, there's a lot of uh, kind of uh, that were the first, of course, um, <laughs> very strange uh, augmented reality devices to the right. You see that uh, every young person has that on the smartphone already, uh, extending their own face with some augmentations. And uh, of course, augmented reality is already applied in, in different ways, like uh, to get information about the shops nearby. Uh, there are first attempts to have augmentation at the workplace. And uh, there are this kind of new devices that are developing very quickly in technology. You can see here an overview. Uh, the Google Glasses was maybe top left, something that uh, has more a prototypical 
uh, meaning, but uh, in the meantime, uh, like the HoloLens that you see down below in the middle, uh, these kind of devices, of course, you don't wear it each day, but they get more and more miniaturized and uh, they have wonderful uh, already visualizations and uh, also eye tracking basically implemented uh, since eye tracking gets more and more uh, miniaturized. It gets more and more into every day and uh, to the to the down bottom to the left you see already very kind of uh, glasses that look like uh, everyday glasses and and uh, that is the development and what we have uh, investigated in a national project called AR Demenz or uh, AR Dementia is uh, what can we do for the person, for the vulnerable person with dementia. We have to be very careful, of course, because uh, we don't want to confuse the person with additional information that is misplaced or not placed uh, not right uh, in time. And uh, what you see to the left is something where some very useful uh, uh, services that are prototyped by the Austrian company Met, like augmenting uh, kind of medicament packages with some information when to take it and so on, or remote assistance uh, when uh, something by video service, uh, some uh, beloved one uh, can aid in assist in, in giving some recommendation how to use, for example, close the right uh, close during the day and so on. Here also the medical university University uh, Graz, Sandra Schüssler was uh, part, important part of the project uh, and uh, kind of uh, guiding the requirement analysis, the study plan and so on and so forth. And to the right is the technology that uh, we are at UNAM Research uh, developing, uh, taking a HoloLens, which is of course not for everyday uh, use, but maybe uh, if there is a visit of a caregiver, for example, a formal caregiver like the MAS uh, service uh, assistant trainers that we have seen before, uh, they can, for example, play a game with the person. And uh, the idea is that uh, these games can be used for cognitive assessment, for screening. Uh, and one of these uh, playful ways to have a cognitive assessment, uh, firstly, primarily uh, brought up by Shelley's uh, is the Tower of London, uh, which is like three columns, very easy, uh, with three differently colored uh, balls. And uh, you have top to the left, the start position, and you have a, a goal position, and you have in a minimum number of steps to move one ball after the other, so that uh, here, for example, in two steps, you end up with the goal position. And uh, this kind of Tower of London game is uh, has been uh, investigated in many ways. It has been applied also for persons with dementia in specific ways. And uh, we are just in the first steps uh, to go on uh, with the implementation. We have done that uh, with the HoloLens. And uh, of course, uh, here is just uh, first, uh, the very first version of it. You can see that uh, uh, the elderly can like, uh, uh, move one uh, ball to the next one, can play it uh, until like here the, the, the goal uh, has been reached. And uh, these are initial steps, of course, we want to design it as playful as possible. Uh, in the first step, we just designed it that is like close to a standard psychological test, just to compare it in this way. Uh, and uh, what you can see here, is uh, top right uh, the view if you're using uh, the, the augmented reality glasses, the HoloLens. Uh, here, uh, basically, it's put on a table with the green dot. You see uh, the uh, eye gaze uh, on the environment. So, gaze is part uh, of the measurement of the device. Uh, bottom right, uh, you see uh, actually from a field test with uh, non dementia, people, non, not person with dementia, but uh, with, with uh, actually um, person who are employed uh, at our site just for the first test how uh, if, there, if the technology is usable or not. So we have to make our 
kind of um, yeah experiences we have to collect the feedback and that is the first step what you see here is that uh, the system can be like put on any table uh, and then the augmented reality game can start more or less and uh, of course with one game maybe you can think yeah okay i can anyway use uh, the real column the the wooden ones uh, the wooden balls and so on but uh, of course this is the first step uh, later on you want to use different games uh, make it personalized and and uh, make the the person select uh, herself uh, the the game that she wants to play so to enrich the whole thing and this this is a starting uh, point so to say with with the first uh, game uh, you can see that the person has just one minute to go on and uh, get a kind of goal position and of course this implementation is not yet ready for uh, for a person with dementia, but uh, I think it will be soon in this direction. We will make it more colorful, nice. Of course, the person with dementia will decide themselves through their feedback in user-centered design, uh, how they really uh, wish to have it. And then uh, from playing this game, we uh, intend to get a kind of indication uh, estimation about the, the cognitive assessment and uh, that is meaningful because usually a person needs this neuropsychological test battery every six months or something it's very extensive and we think that by playing different games uh, all over the time and then if people like to play the game uh, maybe not every day but uh, several uh, times a week uh, or a month then you get an estimate of uh, how their state the cognitive state and mental state is and that might help a lot and by the way also at the same time also provide the training i'm just jumping a little bit uh, ahead what you can see here is uh, yeah to the right the person that is playing the game and uh, to the left at the same time uh, synchronized in time uh, what the person is seeing yeah so it's meaningful what our colleagues are doing. Uh, it looks like a little bit uh, uh, strange, just moving the arm uh, in the air. But so in this sense, uh, the game was finalized, yeah. Yeah, well, uh, we think that these are new dimensions actually for measurements uh, using eye tracking, eye movement feature, we think we can uh, even there are some investigation that you can uh, maybe estimate the degree of uh, the cognitive impairment and uh, maybe also going towards estimating uh, effective uh, states and so on and so forth. And uh, this is kind of our research and uh, I hope you were interested to follow this particular point. Well, uh, currently I do not see any questions um, in this sense, then uh, I would uh, first uh, switch to our overview slide and uh, we have a final video on the virtual reality based mindfulness training and uh, I would then go on preparing this. Yeah, so we here we are again. Um, this is about uh, another project uh, you have seen today already. The presentation by uh, Dr. Professor Wood uh, about the EEG measurements. And uh, basically that was a very relevant part of the joint project OpenSense uh, that we coordinated and uh, we're very happy to cooperate. Uh, at the same time, EEG measurements were captured. We uh, captured uh, eye movement features by eye tracking. And uh, you can see here some uh, impressions uh, using applying the virtual reality headset uh, with the person uh, um, 
uh, of dementia with dementia. And uh, that project surprisingly was again done with Sandra Schüssler from Medical University of Graz. Uh, we, are very, we are very happy always to cooperate with you, Sandra, of course. And here again, requirement analysis and evaluation study plan were outlined uh, by the Medical University of Graz. And the uh, Sozialverein was uh, providing uh, access to the person with dementia, in, uh, informed consent, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, different kind of other partners were uh, cooperating in different ways. University of Graz was, of course, uh, providing all the knowledge about uh, yeah, uh, EEG measurements, uh, applied that, and also you see here uh, basically colleagues from the University of Graz also uh, assisted a lot and, and very substantially in the field test. Yeah. Here you see the recruitment video, uh, this kind of explaining uh, to those who would like to join uh, the field test, uh, the overall setup. The presentation of the headset, uh, the weight of it, uh, weight was actually not so much the problem, I think. Uh, so uh, people were instructed and uh, actually uh, then they were really completely immersed in the, in the experience. And uh, you see here that nicely in a study, I mean, of course, this is not something that will go into everyday life of person with dementia, but it was uh, important to measure that. Here, Dr. Silvia Kober from University uh, Graz Institute of Psychology explains uh, what's the meaning uh, of attaching this kind of electrodes and uh, what is intended to be measured. Yeah, so you see here every step. So the people were very much cared about everything, so they were offered also uh, uh, to uh, kind of a service at the, so to say, near Qatar. Uh, nearby, so in order to restore their, their hair style and so on. And uh, that was what you see now is the introduction to the intervention, which is kind of uh, make uh, the person uh, actually sensitive to their uh, senses of uh, watching things, details, uh, listening to sounds and uh, basically to get aware uh, and uh, become mindful about their environment. Another part was the calibration. Uh, what is uh, this is still necessary for eye tracking devices uh, in with virtual reality? Actually, uh, there are new glasses already out there on the market, and we are already uh, using them. Uh, where you don't need anymore the calibration means that uh, the technology knows. Uh, that where we are looking at, and this has to be done in, in several steps that we find it a little bit playful way. Uh, here, that's a component that kind of, uh, of uh, engaging person to look into detail. So if they, with the eye tracking device in the headset, if they look for some time into uh, a detail, then kind of Zoom is opening up and giving more details. 
and uh, maybe that's a small step to, to getting more mindful about your environment. What you can see, uh, you have seen, for example, Venice. Uh, so the people enjoyed very much to be on a place where they either never have been or where they yeah, wish to be one time or uh, they have been there and have very positive uh, memory about that. And so for elderly people who cannot move anymore so much and person with dementia, um, that is a very important point that uh, they just can use this kind of VR devices for to, uh, positive engagement uh, against depression uh, and uh, also in some degree uh, these kind of uh, videos can motivate them to go out and uh, in their near environment, their garden or whatever to, to enjoy uh, with their senses uh, details that they were not aware before. So we have uh, introduced also some videos about their close nearby environment, uh, a park nearby, for example, in the city or uh, what you can uh, enjoy in a nearby forest and so on. So this is kind of uh, making them more active uh, to enjoy their environment and uh, maybe this is also a way to enhance their cognitive reserve uh, on, on a small scale. Yeah, so what you see here is kind of uh, basically the content of the intervention. You see on the left side the, the body scan. There's a short video with a Felgenkreis a trainer who is introducing to do a body scan. This is a kind of an overall structure of mindfulness training uh, in the sense of kabat -Zinn. And then you have a kind of uh, relaxing uh, video, then something uh, that is appealing to the eye and then there are other videos that are kind of associated with different senses in a way that the videos that are shown they provide a kind of imagination as if you are smelling something so for example in the when you're kind of see a, a video about a very good bread so Austrians they like very much specific different ways of bread uh, or uh, if they're uh, listening to an orchestra uh, with very nice sounds uh, or they see some dogs around, they, they would like to touch them. So in this sense, uh, trying in an indirect way to uh, activate the different senses. In the end, uh, there was again a, a body scan, and that was the VR intervention that was then investigated through the EEG. And, uh, well, that's uh, about the, the overall project. Um, Sandra, maybe, uh, sorry, may I ask you maybe to comment a little bit in this direction because uh, you have a lot of uh, information about the evaluation. Yes. So in this project, we had uh, two groups. We have one group with persons with life dementia and the control group was with healthy people. And we compared only how they differ about the different scenarios. And they saw in all these uh, scenarios you have seen, and we had very good results for these people with dementia because for many people, it was extremely an emotional feeling. For some people, it was the first time that they saw the beach. And this was for them very interesting. And also the sea. So some people only go down and down um, to look and to, they like to feel the, the water. It was very interesting. And they also like the, the smell. So for example, we had also a scenario with bread and they, they smelled the bread and they said, oh my God, this is so realistic. This was very interesting. And most of the people with dementia like the, the forest, to go to the forest and to smell the forest. 
and the like the pitch. So these two scenarios were the, the most interesting for the people with dementia. Thank you. So in total, uh, it was uh, accepted quite well. And we have also a, a successor project, a, a next project, uh, where uh, a company naturally is also kind of uh, has a surface that is also now designed according to the emotion, to the requirement of the person. Yeah, so in the sense, uh, we are pursuing this direction. Uh, what you can see here is we have eye tracking in the, in the headset, in the device. So person that are using the device, they, they don't see, they don't uh, really know. I mean, of course, they know it from the, from the information, uh, information content, but uh, it's not uh, invasive in any way. Uh, it's just analyzed and uh, what we can uh, actually extract from the, from the gaze behavior of the people just from watching a single video of three minutes, uh, we can, of course, with this limited population, but uh, statistically significant, uh, we can uh, discriminate between uh, healthy people and people with dementia, so with Alzheimer. So in this sense, we can classify, uh, classify on the basis of a three minute video. What you can see to the right is that we can also, there's a high correlation of uh, eye tracking features, eye movement features uh, with a mindfulness score that is uh, more or less uh, used in many uh, assessments, investigation. Uh, and uh, in this sense, we are going in the direction of estimating also what is the mindfulness state, so to say, of a person. And it's also interesting to see from the evaluation that uh, the score is significantly lower uh, for a person with dementia than for person, uh, healthy person. And uh, in this sense, it is kind of matching very well to the results from the EEG analysis that you have seen before, uh, that uh, this kind of intervention uh, would help in the direction of uh, the mindfulness training. If people get more mindful, then maybe they get healthier also. <laughs> it's in a very indirect uh, conclusion. Yeah, I want to go forward here. Uh, well, in, in general, just as a final uh, uh, kind of uh, conclusion, uh, yeah, what Sandra has said, uh, it was very positive from the, from the experience and uh, the intervention maybe is impulse for the people to get more aware, to get more active. And particularly, of course, now in the time of COVID-19, uh, it can be a service for them to be entertained, to get positive emotion and so on, since they are isolated a lot. And uh, yeah, Sandra, may I give over, give over to you for the final word for the, for the VR intervention, please, what that means for the person with dementia. I think VR is very interesting for the future. It's also interesting to use it in nursing homes, but also in home care, because you have this combination. For mindfulness training, you have this relaxing part, but also you can combine it with, uh, yes, with the senses, to activate senses. And this is very important for people with dementia, for every sense. And you can use it to help them to, to see activities or maybe in the future to do activities they cannot do at the moment because they have care dependency. So for freedom activities, for example, it would be very interesting because also if uh, some is uh, possible in a nursing home, not every freedom activity a nursing home can support. So therefore there are so many opportunities for different freedom activities. And I think this is the special. Thank you, Sandra. <laughs> Very nice words. Yeah, so uh, basically I see there are no questions currently. Um, and uh, of course you're invited and highly welcome to contact me, to contact Sandra, to contact uh, whoever you have seen uh, uh, during the whole day. 
Uh, we are at the end of the program. Sorry, we are a little bit uh, over time, but I hope you enjoyed it. There are still visitors here. Thank you so much for your interest and your attention. Um, yeah, I would like to say uh, a goodbye in a sense that maybe we can see us next year in Krems if there is no COVID uh, anymore. Uh, let's see. So we are interested to uh, have... Uh, no, we have, uh, uh -huh, okay, we have a comment. Thank you from Jefferson Felipe Silva de Lima. I am from Brazil and I'm just starting my PhD at the University of Coimbra. I want to research in the area of human-centered computing, focusing on people with dementia. Today's speeches and presentation made me confirm even more my desire to research in this area. So thank you so much. As well as the impact that computing can have in improving the quality of life of people with this condition. Thank you very much for the event. It was a pleasure to spend the day. Thank you so much uh, for your very kind uh, comment and uh, just give it over to all the presenters and, and to Sandra. Uh, we take it as a motivation to also to go on. And uh, yeah, uh, thank you very much for all your attention and uh, stay healthy and uh, yeah. See you soon, maybe, <laughs> and all the best for your research and all your application. Bye. I hope you have a lot of inspiration for future research and for the practice. <laughs> Thank you. Bye.